Hey, good morning. Good morning. How's everyone? I hope everybody is doing fine during this pandemic time, and and I hope you are safe, your families are safe, and uh, you know everybody is in a better state right now. Um, thank you very much for joining today for this three-day workshop that you're going to have on what is an entrepreneurial mindset. So whether you are an aspiring entrepreneur or you're a professional in a corporate setting, it is imperative that all of us understand the basics of entrepreneurship and innovation so that we can position ourselves to succeed in today's dynamic market. And they say that, you know, uh, through a Though every entrepreneur imagines success, they must also act with full knowledge that odds are against them. So with this understanding and with this kind of a wisdom, we have to figure out why should we actually, you know, uh, study entrepreneurship, whether or not we want to start a business or not, whether we enter a job market. But studying entrepreneurship certainly helps us to, you know, kind of uh, develop financial literacy, confidence, uh, knowledge on, on how to accept and act on a feedback how to develop a network, how to develop strategic thinking skills, and it promotes growth mindset. And when we're launching a venture, it is important that we validate our business idea with vital early steps. So taking a, you know, any uh, a course on entrepreneurship can help you to learn useful frameworks through which we view our products, we identify the ways uh, to prove that it is of value to the customers. So. Uh, that is the this is the basic premise of having this workshop also with you all and to have uh, you know with us we have uh, mr santiri who has been an instrumental uh, part in our uh, you know uh, all the programs so far and uh, to give you a brief introduction about him he is a serial entrepreneur he is into the edtech uh, space he specializes in games and education you must have heard about minecraft he is a, he was a co-founder with minecraft education He's a gamer. He's a he's a concert pianist. He calls himself wannabe, but he, he does play very well. Um, he works with the Satakunta University, and along with that, he's also uh, heading various projects, which include small holding co company, Teacher Gaming, that helps the entrepreneurs to pursue their dreams. Uh, I would like to uh, thank you, uh, Santini, for being here today, and I'll hand over the virtual mic to you. Well, thank you, Anamika, for the kind introduction. So glad to be once more online with you guys. It has been a while. Um, you know, sun, sun is shining at least in, in Finland. So hope the hope you know things are getting better also in India side. We have been he hearing the news, so hope all of you and the close ones are safe. Uh, and uh, you know, uh, it it has been a really really saddening time uh, for all of us. But uh, hope hope we are getting getting to a better direction. Now, what Anamika said uh, just. Just uh, briefly uh, at the very beginning, entrepreneurship for me has been a transformative experience. Uh, so uh, at the very beginning, I was sort of thinking of I'm gonna become an entrepreneur after my father's uh, sort of footsteps. But uh, around five years of being an entrepreneur, you know, being being the boss of myself and you know handling all all of the information and all of the decisions that had to be done, uh, the growth. That that I experienced, uh, the feedback that I was getting from other people was just like, "Are you like 45?" No, I'm I'm 26. Of course, now nowadays I'm like 34, uh, but uh, already the you know the wrinkles were getting when I was you know 26 because it was a lot of stress, of course, uh, <laughs> going through the entrepreneurial times. But you know, people people really you know after this very compact and intense time that that I was I was having for the first 10 years of my career, people the feedback that I was getting that. I'm like much more sort of mature than you know somebody would expect from my age. So that's a good, good sort of an argument for for you to also explore this path because you know it will be it will intensify the amount you will learn and grow. So let's uh, today we have like a ton of stuff to to cover. Uh, also tomorrow. Uh, I know that uh, the audience is is mixed, so we have you know young, passionate. Uh, hopefully, one day becoming entrepreneurs, we might have people that are already entrepreneurs. So I know that some stuff here will, might be you know a bit boring for some people that are way up there, and also for some it might go because it's it's over the top. But really, the focus for especially for today, when we are talking about you know ideas, we are talking about funding things like this. Um, I try to give you 
some like a silent some sort of like a silent knowledge uh what i've learned that you, it's hard to find from the books, you know, how I've been looking at, you know, building businesses, how I've been looking at, you know, planning things, uh, you know, what, you know, in, even if you are, you know, let, let's say 12th grade and you are thinking about, you know, building an idea, building a prototype, like maybe there is some legal considerations there that you might want to, you know, think. And all of those small things, uh, I want to give you like an overview of what type of things you might uh, might want to consider, and also give you a tool. We are going to be using like this massive mirror board. I'll show it you in a second, uh, and that will be basically some but something that you can you can take home. You can you know print whatever, uh, and that will be for you to just you know remind yourself uh, whenever these things come come you know up in the in the future. But so I think that you know our agenda for today starts with ideas, ideas, idea testing, market research, and all that. Anamika, do you have something that you would like to, uh, you know, lead the way, uh, or should I just uh, kick off and, and maybe introduce a bit of my my background and, and the university that I work with, and then get going? Yeah, ma'am. Uh, Santi, you can go ahead. Yeah. All right. Cool. So now let me. Uh, I'll follow the chat all the time. I'll, I'll just move it on my second screen here. Uh, so feel free to ask any questions at any time. Uh, I'm hoping to make this interactive through chat, but I know there's a lot of people, so uh, we are limited with how much interaction we can have. But I try to, you know, follow the chat as much as I can in order to make this interactive. Uh, but now let me first of all share my screen. I have two monitors. Yes, I know. All right. Now, very quickly, uh, just so you know where I am coming from, um, when when we can get the screen share up. Uh, well, background, uh, two years ago, I actually uh, went work, I work in an academia. So I work in a university. So we are doing this uh, with, in partnership with Satakunta University of Applied Sciences. Uh, it's the leading AI hub here in, in, in Finland. Uh, you know, a lot of AI robotics things uh, happening uh, in our in our school. A lot of you know academies, a lot of AI international AI students, all that also coming from India uh, that are with us. Uh, just a couple of facts, of course. I don't want to bore you too much with with some. Uh, let me see if I can actually find it. Uh, anyways, uh, but you know. Um, we have about 6,000 students, uh, really a big focus on tech and entrepreneurship. And obviously, you know, needless to say, if you are looking for places to study in, uh, you know, in your future career, consider Finland, consider our university. Uh, I, I know that it will be life changing. So, you know, but I know that there's a lot of good universities out there, but especially if you are interested in AI, entrepreneurship, robotics, all that stuff, or, you know, technology in, in general, one of the good options out there. Uh, we have recently put together a company called Curiosity Inc. Our main purpose is basically uh, with Incubate India to provide you these contents that we that you are experiencing now. So uh, hopefully uh, you'll you'll join our events in the future as well. Now something that I want to share to you. I don't know if you have uh, realized, but if you look at where Finland is, so let me show you. I am actually in here in Tampere, living next to the lake right here. Uh, and where the university is, is in the separate town here in Pori. It's like a Western Finland. And India from Finland, of course, looks like it's far, far away and looks like Finland is like the furthest country in Europe. But actually, it's the closest Europe, uh, EU country. So if we look at the globe perspective and we are here in India, Finland is the closest European Union country. So if you ever come to Finland, you can say to your parents that you know you are as close to home as you can in European Union if you end up end up working working and studying with us or in Europe in general. But that's a brief introduction. Now we are talking about ideas uh, at the very beginning. So let me open up my presentation and see where I actually have that. That was full screen. And for some pretty weird reason PowerPoint has stopped working, but uh, luckily technical problems are something that we are all very, very knowledgeable of. Okay, just a quick PowerPoint restart and we should be up. Oops. Let's, uh, let's really hope that uh, 
the proper pointed in uh, kill my presentation there. That would be uh, really unfortunate. Mm -hmm. Sorry about the sorry about the problem here. Uh, All right, let me uh, let me figure it out. Mm -mm -mm. That was a, a bit unfortunate. That's my uh, my PowerPoint crashed there. Mm -hmm. Hmm. And now it seems to be it has lost like all the all the all right so sorry about about this guys um uh, really trying to uh get this going but these technical problems of course are a bit uh problematic sometimes all right but anyways so luckily i have some some something else uh we can we can start with um now in in order to build some ideas uh let's uh let's let's first of all get creative let's let's have a bit of a warm-up here now my idea here is that uh i will post an idea here just any idea and your job is to come up with an alternative use for that particular idea so I'll post a like something like a, you know a shoe, and your job through chat is to come up with alternative uses for a shoe. All right, so let's start, and I collect your ideas here. Okay, so alternative use for a laptop. So now come up with alternative uses for laptops. I'm following your. Uh, your chat there and I will be adding your ideas here. And while I'm waiting your, uh, I'm hoping to uh, get my, get my PowerPoint going. Laptop for streaming, gaming, but it's not alternative use. You can do that with, with, with a laptop. Alternative use, what you would not normally do with a laptop. Animation you normally do with laptop. What's something new that uh, you might be... Okay, uh, table, great, that's a good one. Table, chair, great. Crypto mining, well, yeah, I, I guess that's a, that's a good one. Let's uh, get that a bit, pillow, really comfortable pillow. Okay, salvage the monitor, transform into a tablet. Well, that's uh, that's an intensive. Set it for parts. Yeah, just general surface. A mirror. Yeah, with through a webcam. A cool idea. Using it as a server. Yeah, that well, Minecraft server. Why not? All right, let me come up with another uh, another one where you are supposed to come up with alternative uses. Uh, so what what should I what should I have? Uh, flower pot. Come up with an alternative use for a flower pot.
sorry, I'm also just checking that. All right. Finally found our, our presentation. It was not easy, but uh, that's fine. Let me see. Uh, chair, okay. Water, water storage, okay. Why not? Why not? A pen holder, good one. Display, how do you do that? A painting for drinking, yeah. No, a glass, drinking glass. Own stand. Fruit basket. Oh, art, nice. Uh, all right, so we can see we have animal feeder. That's a good one as well. Now, let's get a bit more intense. I am telling you a bad idea. I'm telling you a, a bad idea. Let's say a stone car tire. That's a bad idea, right? Or I mean, it's a silly idea. And I'm trying to give you a bad idea and you are supposed to argue, argue or give an argument why it is actually a good idea. All right, so let's, let's see. Uh, mm, Okay, sandpaper windscreen wiper. Why is it a good idea? You need to argue why this is a good idea. Smooth glass. Yes, maybe depends on how uh, how fine sandpaper you have. It's durable, maybe. That is more dust. Filter out dust. Horn, long lasting. Mm -hmm. Well. Durable is about the same. Easy to replace, is it? Maybe. Good for cleaning, yeah, but uh, not necessarily good for the windscreen itself. Sparkly and shiny, nice effects. Spark, sparkly, shiny. It's cheap. Well, depends on if you count the wind uh, wind windscreen uh, price or not. Doesn't take much energy. Removes the ice. Yes, in Finland. Yes, definitely. All right. Okay, can you come up with a bad idea? Come up with bad ideas, and we'll pick one, and we'll start arguing for that. Come up with bad ideas. Also used to make sandpaper art. Okay, any any bad bad ideas you have? Yeah, you can make a joke a joke about it. Yeah. It definitely damages. That's why it was a bad idea. Okay. But can you come up with plastic oven dish? Great, that's a great one. Okay, plastic oven uh, dish, or was it like a plastic oven? Yeah. I guess we could we could say this. Uh, it could be also plastic oven wooden frying pan. That's also a good one. Uh, let, it's actually. It's about, about the same, so a wooden 
frying pan. Okay, so come up with come up with arguments why a wooden frying pan is actually a great idea. We do have wooden pens. We have paper boats, right? I mean, not durable. Using black ink for polish. Dull knife. Yeah, you, you can hurt yourself with that. Eco-friendly. Wooden frying pan, eco-friendly, great, definitely. Fireproof, insulation of heat. Well, it's cheap. It, 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 I mean, if you go to IKEA, a frying pan is like 8,000 rupees or less, a good one. So I don't know if wooden frying pan can be cheaper than that. Uh, it's cheap. Uh, give smoking flavor. That's a great one. Gives smoking flavor. That's actually a really good one. Good for health. How come? Insulation, long lasting, no rust. Great. Definitely no rust. It's food quicker. Well, counter argument to that metal definitely uh, trans transfers heat better than wood. Durable. I don't know about that. Can be homemade. Excellent. Ancient method used for cooking. It's not heavy. Light. In, maybe. All right. Now, let's stop here. Uh, but what we can clearly see, at least everybody who's at the chat, we can come up with a lot of ideas very fast. We can turn bad ideas into good ideas very fast, especially in a collective form, what we are doing here. So keep that in mind. Let's move to the next one. Let me give you a business idea. And then I would be curious to hear your business ideas here. I know that some of you uh, might not, of course, I'm not telling you that, hey, if you if you have your, you know, your coolest business idea ever, you should share it now with, with all these folks online. Well, feel free to share whatever ideas you might have. You don't have to share your love, the best idea you ever ha have, have had. But I will share my business idea that I'm building currently. And I would be curious to hear your business ideas. And really, there is a point where we're going to discuss ide ideas and why ideas actually do not matter in a moment. And that's why I would be curious to hear your ideas so we can get them out, so we can focus on something much more important. So. I'm actually doing growth hacking for universities. That's a buzzword, I know. It's a company, but about what? Rural healthcare, perfect. Online teaching. Tech business, about what? Edible water bottle, nice. One. Non-profit education company. Sports Academy, all right. COVID support robot, nice. Or pandemic support ro robot and do other things as well. Megatronic engineer, bamboo toothbrush. Great. Sanitation, be a bit more specific, please. Credit card scamming, well, you know, you can get to jail for a long time for that. Cybersecurity. Space Garbage Cleaning Center, okay. That's uh, futuristic.
cosmetics, what type? Car made of wood. Uh, got, it, got it correctly. Enough free time for students. Emotional support robot, that's a good one. It can be digital robot or drone painter and cementer. Eco-friendly straws, reusable medical tools. Uh, quantum computing everywhere, okay. Biodegradable newspapers. I think those might already be, right? Crypto coin. Yeah, that's definitely <laughs> something people are pretty excited currently. Okay, there's, there's a lot of good, good stuff that I, I'm, I'm missing. So really, really good one. Okay, let's take a solar power car. All right, uh, crypto mining for middle class people. Okay, so is uh, crypto mining for middle class? Okay, all right. Now, let me let me tell you that all of these ideas are at the same time really bad and really good. And but I I'm hundred percent sure. Or let's say 99.9% .9 sure, if you are not extremely lucky, none of these ideas will work in a way that they are in your head currently. And now I would like to tell you a bit of my story about how I came up with my best business idea so far. And hopefully I can make the argument to you that the journey that starts from the idea, the initial idea, is much more important than the first kick. Okay, so hope you are with me. Let's open up the... Now I need to use it like this, which I hope is fine. Because... Uh... All right. Hope you can see it. All right, so, so this is my story about building the best idea that I've had so far, but I'm planning to, you know, create more. And it is actually an Indian researcher, Saras Saraswati, whose idea is that is the that the ideas are not important. And really, she based he, her findings from a massive pool of expert entrepreneurs that she has talked with and researched, and how their business and ideas has been uh, developing in the future, uh, in, you know, after the initial push. So here's my story about the same thing. And, and really, I think that all of us will have multiple opportunities with different ideas, but really what makes the difference between just random person and entrepreneur is that the entrepreneur takes the initiative and the initiative is the important part. I think all of us will encounter good ideas during their life that would provide the opportunity to build meaningful business. But the entrepreneurs take the action. So let's, let me tell you a story. So my first company was a tutoring business. That's the logo that I created myself. And I was in a small town in, in, uh, in Finland. And the business idea was to produce extra classes for K-12 students with the help of teacher students. And I was one of the teacher students. And now the idea was to use the cheap labor of the teacher students and basically use them to provide relatively inexpensive classes for students that needed help. Guess what the result was? I'm curious to, uh, what is K-12? Good question. It's kindergarten to 12th grade. So from K to end of high school. So what? how successful do you think that this idea was? 
I wonder what's the what the not such a good result. Yeah, you are you are correct. The result, yeah, was was actually not a single hour of tutoring was sold. And the interesting part here is that even today there is a company doing the same thing in other city, and they have been struggling for ten years. Ten years of struggle. That's not my kind of entrepreneurship. So what did I learn from that? And clearly, these people that are building the business are not yet getting it. Well, I learned how to establish a company in terms of bureaucracy. So I went to the tax office and all that. I did that. It's different from Finland to India. So I'm not teaching you how to do that in India, but I'm sure there are a lot of people who know. So you get help if you if you want to do that. For example, the Incubate India people, ask them if you want to establish a company. But now, and I also learned that when you get the company running in Finland or in Europe, you get like 200 sales calls from random people that want to sell you something. And if you you know buy them, you'll basically run out of money instantly and you fail. So that was something that I learned because I didn't buy anything. But what did I learn? The most important lesson was to fail fast. It took me about six months to realize that this will not work. And I, I decided to let go. And now I'm not telling you to quit or to, you know, not push hard enough. That's a different thing. But as an entrepreneur, when you have all the information coming to you, you will know if there is a chance or if there is not a chance. And when it looks like you are 95% sure that you are not going to be successful, it is better to fail in my opinion. And the fail fast culture is something that we have very strong here in Finland, where people are testing businesses, testing ideas, testing prototypes, testing game, you know, uh, ideas, whatever. And as soon as they realize they, the idea doesn't match their criteria, they fail it. They basically, you know, stop doing it, they try a new one. And it's really something that I consider money as a secondary resource to time. And of course, time is something that we should spend as well as we can. So really, you know, if you realize that this will not work, you are allowed to fail. And that's part of, I think, wisdom, to my, in my opinion. So I bet about 1,000 euros. That's not a big deal because money comes and goes. Now, then came this game. Uh, this is Minecraft 11 years ago. It looked similar, but very different. And I played Minecraft a lot myself. Uh, and uh, I was a substitute teacher in a school during that time. Now, I asked a couple of my colleagues, my student colleagues, to come to my class and play Minecraft with the students. It was a big hit. The students really loved it. And also the teachers came to the room and they were like, OK, this is actually you know, really cool what you are doing. And something in my head started thinking that, OK, maybe there is something with this game in education, maybe sort of this early sign of an idea coming up. Then a couple of months after that I first tried the game, there was a science festival in the city. And I contacted the science festival organizers and, and uh, you know, suggested a Minecraft workshop at the, at the festival. And they said, wonderful, you know, absolutely come to our science festival, we'll give you a booth. And I was like, OK, well, looks like people are getting excited about this. Super. Please rem remember that I had the company already. It was in the drawer, but it was there. And now I was actually thinking that what if I contact Mojang, the original makers of Minecraft, if they could do something for us for this event? And this is exactly how it went. And this is now the key point, the initiative that I took. So I sent an email to Carl. Actually, I don't anymore play Minecraft, but uh, I, I've been following, following the game. I play other games as well. So now I send to Carl, the CEO, you know, my idol. I, I was playing the game. I was, you know, he was my idol with, with Notch and some other people. And uh, I was like, hi, Carl, hope you are well. 
we are taking part in the science festival in Joensuu, Finland, and we're doing a, mine, a workshop with Minecraft. Would it be possible for you to support us in some way? And we would be very grateful for a couple of game licenses because we didn't have any money and maybe a couple of t-shirts to, you know, wear a Minecraft flag. And that would help a lot. Hoping for your positive response. This was my email to that guy who gets like 1000 emails every day. Surprise, surprise. He answered, said, hey, Sandri, I'm well, hoping you are too. Happy to help. Great to know what you are doing. How many licenses do you need? How about t-shirts? Send me your address and I'll send it to you. Good luck with the event. I was like, whoa. He, he replied. And I was like shocked, pretty much. And you can imagine me being at the science festival front door, getting the FedEx package with all the t-shirts and all that stuff. And I was, I was like shaking of the excitement. And this was me getting connected with my idol game company, pretty much. And I was following when they were setting up their company. You can see Notch there. It's actually a, a picture that uh, <laughs> that I have from uh, from the past. Uh, this is uh, Jacob, one of the main founders. This is Jeb from there. I can't remember this guy's name. Uh, Carl is not uh, on, in this picture, but they were just setting up their company. I was living and breathing, you know, this new startup getting off the ground, like really cool, you know, the coolest team, the coolest game. And I was wishing that one day I would have the same thing, my own team, own office. Perfect. That's my dream. This is my dream. And then an idea came up to, in my head, the initial idea. Well, I have a, already a company and teachers are getting excited about this game. Could my company be a representative for Mar Minecraft in education, at least here in Finland? And so what did I do next? I took the initiative once more. And I sent an email, one single email. Hey, Carl, the event went great. Here's a blog post. The feedback was great and the teachers too were really excited. I have a company and I was wondering if my company could represent Minecraft education in, or Minecraft in education. There were no Minecraft education back then in Finland. What do you think? And he replied once more, great to hear. Everything went well. We'll share your blog. Can we discuss your idea over Skype? Does this time work? And once more, if you think about me, I didn't speak too much English back then. I only played games. I went to school. And now I was going into a Skype call, live Skype call with, you know, the person that I'd idolized. And I was once more, you know, shaking on that call and trying to just get my, my words straight. But what happened? was the conversation went, I was telling the idea. He said, I had no, I have no idea what a representative in education means. I said, well, I don't really have an idea either. He said, why don't we try? And I was like, amazing, let's try. And we were, we were golden. We were going, I, I was actually, you know, getting the Minecraft, you know, to, for me to use. And that was super exciting. And then I found my co-founder, we actually rented like this with our little money. We actually rented this small room and we had the office. I had the team that we started working on this project together with Alexi. Very exciting, very exciting times 10 years ago. But then there was a one more thing. Uh, there was a guy, a teacher in United States, Manhattan, New York. Also, he had a blog about Minecraft overnight the blog became a massive hit and we uh, contacted him through a blog post reply just like a reply on a blog hey joel we are doing this in finland we like what you are doing in the united states why don't we talk and joel said absolutely first skype call when we discussed should we make a joint company out of this and absolutely and now we had the business side doing, uh, run by me, the technology side run by our CTO, Alexi, that you see in this picture on the, on the right here, this is Alexi. And then we had Joel with the massive hype around it. And all it had to do was just emails, blog replies, taking the initiative, communicating to people and stuff was getting together. But one more thing, 
we needed a contract to use Minecraft, right? And I went to the university, I went to a contract law class and all that, tried to figure it out. And, uh, and really, we were able to have like date, what is about signatures, two and a half pages. And actually, Carl tweeted about this. Uh, and he said that just received 60 pager contract from United States and three pages from Finland. The 60 pages was Xbox 360 Minecraft and the three pages was Minecraft for education. So, of course, Minecraft started spreading to schools. This is how Minecraft EDU looked at the very beginning. You could you know, set up a server very easily. Nowadays, Minecraft servers are easy. 10 years ago, they were not easy to set up. So teachers could establish a, uh, a server at their, at their school, at their class. Students were really excited about this, you know, being able to play a LAN party, you know, have a LAN party at school. And a lot of people got really excited about it. And this is us living the dream, uh, you know, having pizza, <laughs> you know, spending time at the office with the team, super excited, you know, living the, living the dream, dream life uh, after like a couple of years of that very first initiative. I've been uh, going through uh, airport security in in Ireland, wearing a uh, like a what is it like a like a fox costume. I've been we we have been having uh, uh, an office next to Penn Station in Manhattan. I've been teaching uh, physics in Korea. I've been evening news in Malaysia. I've been a BBC morning breakfast show. Uh, being giving TEDx talks, you know, more interviews, being on a big stage with a lot of important people, visited, actually this is from India, a space factory in India, super cool, building catapults with my team, and, you know, rest is history, 20,000 schools around the world. But now, this is just the context of how everything went, but let's look into the idea next. So the original idea that we had, uh, that was to sell game licenses to schools and a training package. So this was the idea. We did not make any money from the licenses because in my head, our business was to train teachers. Tr train teachers, not to sell licenses. So result was around 1,000 euros a year revenue. And the schools wanted only the licenses, not the training. So we didn't sell any trainings. We sell maybe a couple trainings. Schools just wanted licenses. All right. Iteration number two. So now the original idea has already transformed tremendously. So we sell the game license with 70% royalty. So 30% margin, like a really bad deal, extremely bad deal for us with training sometimes. Result, about 20,000 euros a year revenue. Still peanuts, like think about running a company, it's peanuts, but really zero profit. Schools wanted to wanted licenses, but they couldn't really use the game because the game was too hard for them to set up at school. So once more, let's iterate. Iteration number three, game licenses, plus a Minecraft education mod that would provide the help to teachers with the setup and the technical problems. 50% margin with the mod included. So already our margin was significantly more. All right, result, 100,000 euros. So multiply that with 80, you get the rupee amount. Uh, 100,000 a year revenue. We were still struggling. I mean, 100,000, it's not that much money if you have like five people working. Very small team, very small salaries, very painful, really scratching the money every resource we could, and schools needed more support and services. Okay, iteration four, game licenses, Minecraft education mod, plus world library, and now, the demographic has had switched from very early adopters to early mass of teachers. And now they once more started, now they finally started asking for training. 
So now we were looking at 60% margin and we were looking at 200,000 euros of revenue per year, very little profit. Once more, 200,000, it's not that much. It's a lot for you to get it in your hand like boom, but it's a, it's not that much money if you have like five people working, they try to buy food, pay for their rent, things like that in Europe especially. So it, it was getting rough. So we were really struggling with trying to get the company going. And schools still needed more support. We needed you know, more schools to be able to adapt this to their curriculum. So iteration number five, a SaaS model, meaning software as a service model like Netflix with cloud servers and a setup fee, including the licenses. So now schools were getting in, paying $350 as a setup fee, get the licenses. And after that, they would have a cloud server monthly paid service running. Now we were looking at 70% margin with all the added value services. And now we started talking. First month, 10,000 euros revenue, recurring revenue, re revenue that comes back every year. And we realized that this was the, what schools wanted in the first place. Second month, 20,000, third month, 50,000, fourth month, 100,000, fifth month, 150,000, sixth month, Microsoft bought the company. So if we look, at, look back at the original idea of me training teachers to the SaaS model that we had at the end, it wouldn't matter at all if somebody would have copied my idea at the beginning, because the idea was totally different at the very end when the company was acquired and it was finally working. So here's the point of why the original idea and why the idea doesn't matter. It's like everything else that comes after you get the original idea. I hope I made my point clear. Uh, with that. So now I encourage you to talk to people about what you are planning, what your vision is, what your idea is, because that will feed the data to you to develop the idea. And by doing that, you are not spreading the idea. You are actually, you know, gathering data to make the idea better and increasing your competitive advantage. Now, of course, if your idea is to set up an ice cream booth at Lashpat Nagar, New Delhi, okay, well, if you are telling that everywhere, maybe somebody else wants to put the same ice cream booth there. So maybe don't share that idea that much. But let's say you're talking about technology. You are talking about literally any of these ideas that were here. They become better through actively pitching, actively having conversations and all that. All right. That was my rant about it. Uh, somebody was asking like how much money the company was bought. Um, so it was high single millions in euros. So not, not a crazy amount of money because we were really early with the business. And unfortunately, Minecraft was uh, sold. So, so we couldn't uh, push the business uh, further without Microsoft involvement. So that's a small secret. Cool. All right. So now let's look into our next, next topic on how to test your ideas. I have a sort of a circle here that we could actually look from two different angles. We can have here uh, physical, physical, and on this side, Virtual. So now, come up, you know, any ideas you might have for testing your business idea. Let me follow the chat and, uh, and any ideas you might have. How could you, you know, gather different types of signals for you to develop your business idea and test if it makes sense? And as a as a quick even you know 
where to focus is that let's say you only have an idea. You maybe have a PDF, like a pitch deck. Maybe you have a website or something like that. But you don't have a product. You don't have something ready. How can you test your survey? OK. Survey people, I would say it's somewhere on the weaker single side. Blog replies. Mm -hmm. Esports team. How many people are finding it appealing? So, yeah, yes. So, just having conversations. Social media, you know. Having the conversations there, you know, prototyping it, yes, and getting feedback from the prototypes. Word of mouth, share my ideas, ask friends, definitely. One disclaimer there friends and family are there to support you. So, they might not be the most critical audience. So please keep that in mind. Online polls. So if you get somebody to answer an online poll, they are already pretty committed. I mean, how many online polls do you actually do? Like, I don't do many. So if I really do an online poll, I would be already invested in the idea in some. So I, I, I consider that a pretty strong signal already. Free trials. If you have a product, free trials. So if if somebody actually uses your free trial, it's it it's pretty it's pretty strong signal. Academic consultation might not uh, make you business, but uh, definitely one thing to do. Consider this uh, black hole in the middle, like the place, like the event horizon where your customer actually makes the purchase. So of course, now we are just, you know, testing. Giveaway. <clears throat> Comments launching a Kickstarter. A Kickstarter is a good one. Like if, if, if somebody, uh, you know, pre-buys it, I mean, they are already through the event horizon at that point. Search engine optim optimization, podcast, competition could be well, if people join. That's definitely one. YouTube channel. Yeah, I mean, if you get if you get social media following, people are already invested into what you are doing. So social media following is definitely a medium medium signal, like in strength. Consulting experts. Definitely. I put that on the dis discussion level. Analytics. Definitely. Advertisement. So yes, so advertisement. So now with with ads let's say about google ads uh, now i'm actually i actually want to put it put it here uh let's do some sort of a So now the idea here is uh, quickly explain this. So if you put ads, now it has a big, big thing, like a big importance is like how many people view your ad, how many of them click it, how many of them maybe subscribe for a newsletter, 
And if you have something available, how many of them purchase it? Also, one thing is very important, cost of click. I would say cost of, you know, they call it like uh, CTA and, and CAC, but, uh, you know, cost of click. So how much, when somebody clicks it, how much it costs to you? And also another important thing is cost to acquire a customer. This is called CAC. So these are some important metrics that you can follow on your website. I just wanted to put it out there because we are not going into details, but especially in the digital format, it is you can like how strong the you know the interest signal for your product is. If you look at this, you can also determine it determine it through this to follow like how many people view your ad, how many find it interesting by clicking it, how many subscribe to your newsletter, and if you have something, how many of them purchase it. So all of these rates have industry standards that you can follow and see. So Google the, Google them, you know, uh, let's put in benchmark uh, against industry standards. Sorry about this quick tangent thing, quick, you know, segue here, but this is really important. So that's why I wanted to just share it to you because it came up. But I know that there is so much. How about investment results? Uh, what do you mean? Government aids. Yeah, so if you get somebody, of course, like an investment is already a good sign. I would put in the medium signal because it is not the customer who is investing necessarily. What is an SMB? Yes, so check records if somebody has tried it before. Absolutely. Like, is this already a successful business? Are others doing it? Are they successful? Absolutely. That's a great point. That's a great point. If, if they can make business out of that, then you can definitely as well. Designing the target audience. We'll, we'll talk about that very soon. Uh, crowdfunding, definitely. Goes to the Kickstarter. But Kickstarter is like pre-sales. Crowdfunding is more like uh, just funding it. Organic advertising, like if you get, if you get like virality, virality, social media. That's a that's a good thing. But uh, now I put the virality still in a weak signal because I I work with a company that is viral on TikTok, but they are not converting their TikTok clicks and views to business. So vir virality might come from just interesting content. They might not show you a sign of the business working. Brand ambassadors, find sponsors, competition mapping, visit schools, you know, just visit anyone. Visit and pitching, visits and pitching, just, you know, pitch. And of course, it's a good sign if you get seed funding, for example, oh, absolutely. If you get investment, yes, if people want to collaborate with you, getting collaborations, would already put on the medium signal. Events, competition mapping, yes, competition mapping, it goes to the Good pitching, absolutely. All right, now, great ideas. Once more, like, a, you know, excellent ways to test things out. Now, really, why we are doing everything on this board is that because I'm sharing you a link to this board and you will have all of these ideas, all of these materials available for you after this, for whatever use you might have. Creating hype. So the diagram here is just a visualization of us this you know having 
weak signals of people being interested in your product and your business to medium signals to strong signals and the actual event horizon where somebody makes the purchase. Now, when somebody makes a purchase, things will not end here naturally, as we know. We need to nurture the customer. We need to you know, keep good care of the customer so they, they come back, they purchase again. You know, we need, want, want to give good uh, customer you know, uh, support experience, uh, to ask them to write good reviews about us, all that. So don't think that the sale is the ending point. You know, of course, you nurture people and you funnel people to make the purchase, and then you nurture them to give good feedback, give good rating, have positive experience about your product and your company, maybe come again or recommend your company to their friends. Cool. Okay, now, here are some ideas for you to test your ideas. And all of these, I mean, most of these are something that do not need any money from you. Maybe something requires, but uh, most of this is something that you can test without spending a single rupee. So let's say you now came up with an idea. You want to know, will it work? You have you know, 25 tools here for you to test the waters if the idea works or not. That's why this is there. But now, in order to start moving towards this ad boy here, somebody actually getting invested in terms of money, but also to you. So how do you know that this business is worth building? You need to understand the market, right? Uh, yes, like yes, the industry trends, uh, market segmentation, all that. It's like a good, good stuff. Uh, now, sorry if I can't, you know, write everything here. I try my best, but uh, there is uh, there's a lot of things that you can do. So let's move into the market analysis. I know that. Uh, that there's a lot of information we are going through. Now, really, the minimum that I hope you understand here is that you remember, you know, the ideas being just the beginning. Then, you know, ways to test your ideas. Then, you know, of course, more the online component here. And now we are going into how can you actually understand the market you might be going in. Any questions about uh, about the uh, stuff so far? How can we prevent the idea from being stolen? So uh, I, I come back to a point that I, that I previously, I mean, depends on the idea. Of course, I'm not saying that you should be shouting out any idea out there just to anyone. But uh, so far, with all of my ideas, it has tremendously helped me to just go out and very openly talk about it. So now, if we think about the first sort of level, let, let's, it, let, you are just starting to build a company. You, are, you just have an idea. You, it, the idea comes from knowledge that you already have and why you, why you feel that idea is important. Now, based on that, you have certain networks and certain certain resources that allow you to make that business. What is the chance that somebody would have the same information, would find the same idea important, would have the same network, would have the same time available to build it and all that than you? The likelihood is very low. And and if you have an idea that you might you know make one day it doesn't matter if you are sharing it maybe some somebody is building it in 5 years when you come back to that you know you have a different idea already or you are you know much much better at at that anyways now that's one consideration but the second thing is that all the bis every business like 99.9% .9 of business is is made in interaction with others, meaning that you need partners, you need collaboration, collaborators, you need customers, you need all of that. And now really 
every discussion you have about your idea builds up the information advantage you have. So the more conversation you have, the more you know if the business makes sense and all the details, observations, needs, wants that the potential customers have. All of this builds the advantage of you building the business compared to others. So if you think about now, one of those conversations thinks that, hey, this is a good idea. I want to make it myself as well. You know, you are already so far ahead. So that's why my strategy is to be very open. If you don't feel comfortable doing that, it's up to you. But I've made my case about why I think that open is better. How will how can we set a website and how much do we invest? Well, that's that's a very detailed question that I can um, I, I can't really answer to you. But there are free tools online that you can make a website from scratch. Even I, who is not a developer, can can make that. How do I get a team? Having those conversations that I just mentioned, uh, getting network with you know, students from relevant fields, experts from relevant fields, and, and from there. Uh, all right, should we have uh, a break or should we look into this one thing and then move forward? Anamika, if you are uh, back there somewhere, please let us know, should we take a break or? Uh, see, if you want a break, you can go. Nobody's stopping you, Neelkant. Right? Yeah. There are others who are, who are still into it, so they would like to continue. All right, cool. So let's. this is the last thing before we move to a separate topic. So then we'll have a, you know, a proper break, break so people can you know, go and grab coffee or food and so on. Now, <clears throat> let me introduce you to a couple ways to understand the market you are getting into. There are two main strategies, and obviously, for every business, this will look different. But I just want to give you an idea of how these are done. So then for whatever particular field you are entering, you are interested, you can look into the details. The typical two market analysis tools are, or strategies are even top-down approach or bottom-up approach. Meaning that we look the market from a macro point of view, how the how the market is developing, or we are looking at you know at the very uh, unit metrics of what we can actually sell. So let's let's see how how these two animals function. Let's come up with a business idea. Uh, let's say uh, uh, we are selling sustainable premium or like a high quality children clothing. Okay, that's what we are doing. Okay, what do, what we actually sell, what the products are. So, you know, no shoes, mainly, you know, both. Okay, that's our business idea. So let's open Google. Children clothes market size. I haven't done this before this event. So everything you are learning, I'm learning at the same time. All right. Asia Pacific baby apparel market size is bullish market in USD billions. It's growing. Okay. Let's look into some other markets. What other sources we have? Mm, worldwide market forecast. All right. Looks like we need some uh, subscription for that. So that's not that's not good. Okay. Well, there's a lot of information here. Global children wear market to reach 325 billion by 2025, and now it's 252 billion. Okay, so now from that we can already we can already say 
macro. So for the macro level, market is growing. It, worldwide estimated growth is two uh, from 250 to 350 billion USD by 2025. Okay. Now, question to you: Is this the market for this business idea? Is this the market for this particular business idea? What do you think? If I'm making sustainable, high quality children clothing, expectation it is slightly expensive. I'm not selling shoes. And this is the whole market. Is this the market for me? No, correct, no. So, Perfect. So what is, you know, like we, we need to segment it down a lot. So can you come up with your hypothesis of who will actually buy this type of stuff? Who will be the customer for sustainable, high quality children clothing? Who are the customers for this? Rich, yeah. So, yes, affluent parents. Affluent parents, yes. Anything else? At least middle class, middle class and up. Uh, new parents, I would say like uh, young parents, young parents who are interested in sustainability. Celebrities, you know, yeah. Environmentalists, yes. Yeah, young parents. Yeah, somebody's coming with the, with the biodegradable clothing, absolutely. Who care for the uh, environment? Definitely Gen Z, millennials as well. I'm a millennial, so definitely millennials as well. Yeah, it could be you know non-government organizations. You know, how do I get a good part? <laughs> I'm I'm sorry, I can't uh, answer that question. But this is already like great. So now, if we if we look at, for example, this. Uh, this particular graph and we think about all the stuff that is included we can already argue that it's it might be um you know one fraction maybe 10 or 20 percent out of this and also there is one extra very important aspect what is our target market you know territory So obviously we are not we are not selling to the whole world. So now let's look into if we can. Okay, uh, so stay uh, like a premium children clothing market. Let's see what uh, what comes out. Okay, and designer kids wear. All right. All, well, designer is probably even more expensive what we are talking about here. But just as a comparison, if we are talking about, you know, children wear in, in worldwide market, you know, being based on these statistics, 203 billion, the designer clothes is less than 6 billion. So now my point here is that if you are that type of startup entrepreneur that has this sentence in their pitch deck, this is your product and this is your market. Investors who understand anything about business will laugh you out of the office. So now 
really now we are touching you know the actual size of our market so now if we look at the actual market it's in single probably in high single billions now it's already a significant market to work with but obviously it helps the bigger market we have the better but now there's the other angle to this obviously if now let's say the average sustainable high quality kids shirt is you know 35 usd what if we can produce it high quality sustainable to 30 usd and it's still you know designer it's cool everything maybe we can actually expand the market so it's not like we are stuck with the market that is provided to us with a cool business idea of course we can expand markets and we can create new markets especially with the minecraft edu idea um, it was a completely new market of schools buying entertainment video games so very different compared to normal you know uh normal learning games but really the key takeaways are realistic approximate Approximate size, like have an op approximation. So, if we are selling only, let's say, kids designer shoes, we might be looking at a billion dollar market. And if we look at the competition, if we look at the investment that goes into that, it might be that the market is just so limited that we should at least have a premium line and we should have a more, you know, easygoing line. But now branding in those situations are hard because it's hard to be a premium brand and a middle class brand at the same time. But but this is this is important. So you have like a realistic, focused, approximate size for your market. Uh, approximate market size. Then another key takeaway. Is, of course, the territory. Well, which countries are we actually going? Which countries? Uh, which order? So we can look into. Uh, of course, we want to know the competition. Competition. And then finally, one of the most important thing is the market is the market bullish or bearish and what this means you have probably heard this in the in the uh, please zoom in sorry about that sorry i didn't uh, see the see the message uh yeah hopefully you can see it now why this is important uh is that typically investors want to move into uh bullish market to a market that grows you know that that grows where bear market tends to go down or or like a, if you look at you know this graph for example the one that we were looking at pre previously Santi, uh, can yes. we increase the size a little more uh yeah I, I try to do my best yeah yeah thanks yeah sorry about if you if you uh yes so now you can see here this is a bull market so it's growing. But let's say if we would be going from this side, so this would be the 2016 image, and this would be the 2027 forecast, it would be a bear market. There are, of course, businesses that could you know, thrive in a bear market, not saying that. But if you are pitching something to an investor, it typically helps if you can have a bull market that you are entering in. So that's just one, one key takeaway out there cool now so that from the top-down perspective we have now looked into our market we have tried to uh really drill down to a segment that is meaningful for us 
that we would actually know like what is the premium kids clothing market in India, for example, for babies and for toddlers, for example, without shoes. Okay, that's our key market. What's the size? Realistic approximation, territory, India. Maybe we move to Indonesia, Pakistan, China, Europe at some point. And do we see the market being bullish or bearish? Now, the next way to look into this. Sorry about if, if, the, if the kid is crying in the background, but uh, uh, let's. Uh, it's our two year old just uh, trying to have lunch and disagreeing with, with his mother. The, 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 the other thing is, uh, is the bottom up approach. And now, for bottom up, we need to know a few things. We need to know how much our product costs, you know, approximation. What is our margin? You know, uh, total price minus production ETC costs. Let's have that there. And then what we also need to know, and this is the hard question, we need to know the approximate amount of potential customers. All right. So this is the, the last one is the hard one to, to figure out. So let's give it a, give it a go. Uh, three, please. Okay, why not? Anyways, we can, we can go with that. Let's say, let's start with the easy ones here. Uh, let's say our, our shirt is 300 USD. Uh, 30 USD, not 300. Uh, what is our margin? Let's say it's after taxes, it's 10 USD. And now we need to figure out how many customers do we have? All right, how do we do that, guys? Give me Google search parameters. How can I find it? Any ideas? How do I find? Let's say my, my, I'm 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 wanting to sell premium kids clothes in India. How do I find how many customers I might have? Google Trends. Yeah, how much? Yeah, people are medium income individuals. Okay, let's try to find that uh, middle class in India. Okay. 55% of Indian population expected to join middle class. Would they buy 30 USD children clothing? Online polls, find number of rich people. That's, that's a good one. Let's say upper middle class in India. Size of upper middle class in India. Let's look into this. The anatomy of Indians middle, India's middle class. Uh, let's see what we have here. Sorry about uh, you know scrolling this uh, down a bit quick. 28% of India's population is middle class of 3% uh, is upper middle class. Okay, so then we need a calculator. Not like that. Okay. Now, India has how many people? So now uh, it's a good one that like find the, you know, the total annual sales of similar companies. That would be actually a good one. But that's uh, that can be a hard information to get, uh, and uh, it's uh, not possible for us with the, with a small time. But definitely one good benchmark, really really good one. So uh, 1.3 billion. Sorry about that. <laughs> I'm not good with the crores. Uh, okay, one. Din din din, din din din. Okay, are we there? And one point. 
misclick. Okay, we have 39 million upper middle class people. Can that be correct? I think it can. So now, from them, what's the average size uh, of upper middle class family in, uh, in, in India? Size of upper middle class family in India. Can we find? It might be very hard to find. But let's assume that they are four people families. Four people families. So uh, if we just for the for the demonstration's sake, obviously this might not. Uh, I would do the analytics more carefully. Yes, but uh, just to give you an idea. Okay, we might have about twenty million kids. How many do we assume are let's say one to seven? Should we assume there are maybe five million? Three or four, yeah, four or five. Yeah, it's a good one. Thanks for confirming that. So let, let's assume that <clears throat> these families have, you know, five million under under uh, seven-year-old kids, and this would be now the group of people that we would be actually selling. For these kids, we will be actually selling the our product. So, five million upper middle class, zero to seven years old. All right, and we know that all of these kids, they might want to have, uh, they might might have like two or three shirts per. Uh, per year, right? But they might buy only one from us. Well, population of Finland is only 5 million. <laughs> that, that's, that's correct. So it's very small. But now what's interesting here now is that a typical, and now this is something that you can use for your pitch deck. A typical, let me, I need to, uh, uh, I need to, get out that rid of that so let me have it like that okay now let's do a small small graph here maybe maybe there is a way to make a more beautiful one but uh if we if we expect that uh during the next during the next uh okay thank you uh, let, me, let me see if I can get a decent, uh, there we go. This is a bit silly, but uh, you, you, can, you can do this better than, 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 than I do. Okay, this is actually too weird. Uh, let me get a, why, why doesn't, uh, it doesn't move. Anyways, okay. Let's, let's do it like that. So now, typically what we assume is that first year, we will reach maximum of maybe half a percent of our, say we, we come to the market here, let's call it, we come to the market 2022, we have our brand ready. We know now our, we know our price, we know our margin, we know how many customers we have. So this is a typical pitch deck numbers, just for your reference. Uh, I'm sure that Rohit, if, if Rohit is uh, the CEO of Incubate is following this, he can correct me, but I'm just giving you one set of numbers and you know you can play with this and, uh, and it might be that some investor expects something else, but this is the typical number that we see in Europe. In five years, we expect to reach 5% of our market. So now, 4%, 2026,
uh, let's say uh, 3%, 25. Uh, 2%, 24, and finally, 1%, 23. Okay, so this is us, our startup, entering the market. Now, we know that we have 5 million people, 5 million kids to equip with clothing. Now we can see that, okay, if we are successful, how much revenue are we building the first year? So, five million, five million times uh, thirty, five uh, percent times thirty. So, if we are, I would I would say this a very very bold statement, but if we are able to sell to half a percent to 5 million kids, we would be already making 7.5 million uh, with our price tag with this logic. So 7.5 MUSD in revenue. And then if we look at the same thing, 5 million, if I'm, if I'm calculating this wrong, by the way, let me know. I present once more and then 10% and we would be making 2.5 million in profit. I mean, margin, not profit, margin. That allows us to you know, pay our own salaries. Obviously, if we look at this, uh, we don't need to calculate all of this, but let's say, let's say that uh, <clears throat> this, is, this is pretty easy to uh, calculate. So four times that. So 10 million and 30 million and so on. Now, these statements, of course, would require you to be whole of India, uh, catering to all the 5 million kids. So it is a very bold statement. But in a massive country like India, if you get good partners, you have done your pitch well, you have a nice product, you get it to some fancy malls, some fancy web, web stores across India, you know, the volume is there, you could make a lot of money. So <clears throat> now the point here, you know, through bottom up unit metric calculation, we have first of all identified our price and our margin. Of course, these are hypothetical, we need to understand that. We have our approximate market size in terms of actual customer units. And then if we put this into a line where, you know, first year, half percent, second year, one percent and so on, all the way up to five percent. And these numbers are typical pitch deck numbers. These are the revenues that we would start accumulating. I'm not going to, you know, massive detail, but I don't want to take that much time. And now finally, and by the way, I'll share the link. So there's, I know there's a lot of information here. I hope you can you know, follow. I know this might be a super confusing. Uh, the last thing is that now, if we look at here, uh, these three different things, I'm not going into details with this, but these are some paramet parameters that you quite often cover oh it's not working on my with me today it seems like so very typical parameters that people put on their pitch decks and I mean, if you already make these calculations to your pitch deck, you have a pitch deck that is better than 90% of people out there pitching. You have done your homework better than 90% of people. So if, if this sounds complicated, that's because it's complicated. But if you want to make an impression, like a pretty positive impression of you doing your homework, this kind of stuff is there. 
<clears throat> so now, as a final thing before we have a break, just I want to mention these three different concepts. So now, um, the target addressable market, the service address, serviceable addressable market, um, and then serviceable obtainable market. A bit of a typo there, but let's not worry about that. So the TAM, the target addressable market, is like the whole market in the world that could potentially purchase your, your product. So if we are selling a high quality children clothes, the target addressable market, of course, is massive. It's massive. But then we come to, you know, to the other, the more interesting market. So this is just the paint, you know, the big, big painting, like what the big picture is. But then we come to closer to the what we can actually do and what's important for our thesis, our investment thesis. And why should somebody invest? It's like which markets in the long run we can actually service. Like, okay, now we are focusing in India with these calculations, but could we service China, Pakistan, India, Bangladesh, other places around us? And do we have a plan? How do we enter those markets? From there, we discover the serviceable, addressable market. And then finally, this is the first cherry that we can pick. And this is the serviceable, obtainable market right now. So this half a million kids with their parents buying high quality children clothing, you know, our penetration to the serviceable, obtainable market, the very initial market we are entering, the penetration in the next five years would look like what would be drawn here. So these numbers, these statistics in your pitch deck are something really common that you know people that do their homework on their pitch decks, they have these numbers ready. Sorry about the Zoom, I try to remember it. I know it's 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 a lot of information, I know it's confusing. I teach this, you know, to our uh, university students and it's hard for them. So I understand if it's complicated, but this is just, you know, a real life stuff that you can see from good pitch decks and, you know, pitch decks that actually get funding from founders that actually do their homework. So hopefully this was a very quick overview of you. How do you make a money logic for your pitch deck? And how do you test your market? So one important thing is that, let's say if I would be entering into a market, I would be looking at the market size myself because I wanna know if there is business to be done. So that's the important part. So let's, uh, yes, so some again, you know, it's a base, I try, try to, uh, I try to be, uh, I try to recap this. So target, addressable market is the worldwide big market out there just the big picture the serviceable addressable market is the markets that we can actually service in the next 10 years in the foreseeable future if we are now starting in finland i would say in five years we could be in sweden norway denmark estonia some of the neighbors maybe or United States, maybe. So which markets can we service in the future? And what is the size of that market? And then finally, the serviceable, obtainable market that is obtainable to us right now. Like in our example here at the top, selling premium, high quality, sustainable clothes to Indian parents, upper middle class. This is the number of kids that we expect there to be so this is the obtainable market for us for this idea and this would be the penetration
Yes, and all the all the taxes and everything. These do not take taxes into account. So this is without taxes. So now, obviously, the Excel for your business with all the numbers would look different. This is the overview of you know framework where you can start putting in your numbers. All right, now. A lot of stuff. Should we take a quick break? Maybe five minutes. Somebody was asking about how you mark your attendance. So there will be a quick survey coming after this with some key takeaway questions from this session. And when you answer those, uh, then basically we know that you have participated or not. And these questions will be something that everybody who joined the session will know. Uh, what the right answers are. All right, any questions or should we should we take a five minute break? Anamika, you can also chip in here if. Uh... I think we can go for a five minute break. Cool. OK, let's have a five minute coffee break. I'll leave my uh, stream running. I also uh, just get a glass of water. And let's start uh, five minutes from now. We have some funding and legal things to cover before we have our guest startup story. It's going to be exciting. So in five minutes, we'll join back to sure. this. Uh, and uh, let me also. It's, it's small on purpose. We'll zoom in. <laughs> Thanks.
are very close to getting back on the show. So, so far, um, I was reading the comments. So uh, one thing is children are a bit disappointed that it is not a personal experience. Well, uh, we will give you a personal experience. You know, the idea here was there were too many students and the one-on-one -on -one conversation would have hampered the flow of the workshop. And if you look at the chat and you notice what kind of conversation is happening, that is certainly hampering the whole thing. Um, about uh, what you have understood so far, what Sanjali has told you so far, so you right now uh, understand one thing you know when i was growing up or when uh, you know uh, santri was growing up as a matter of fact we did not have an exposure to the kind of things that you are having right now the workshop is intended for you to be aware of the of the terminology of the of the system of the processes right from this stage and you have plenty of time to develop on that you know, so that's the basic idea. We don't expect you to understand the numbers right away. We don't expect you to, you know, have a very creative idea one, all of a sudden. Idea here is understand what it is right now. Somebody mentioned that, you know, he's making notes. Such a beautiful thing to do. So that is, that is for me a sort of, you know, dedication that, oh, you really want to take it forward. You want to really uh, apply what you're learning. So that, that makes sense to me. So here, we do not want to make, you know, it's not that after a three-day workshop, you are going to become an entrepreneur. You would be good enough for that. You won't need more training. You would certainly need more training. But at least once out this, these three days are over, you would actually go back, reflect on that. And now every problem situation that you look at, that would be from the perspective of the things that you have been taught or you have been acquainted with. That's the basic idea. Yeah. Yeah, that's a uh, that's a well well said. Yeah, I, I mean, apologize, of course. I mean, we want to. I mean, it would be really great to, you know, go into details with all the business ideas that you have, but you know, a lot, lot of people uh, and a limited time. So, I really encourage you to uh, find uh, a university that has very strong commitment to entrepreneurship, who has mentors available and that's really the place for you to start building. Of course, you can start building whenever, uh, but if you want that personal, really that personal information, that's and help. That's that's the place. And of course, people like Incubate India are are great resources to uh, to get help. You know, incubators and and things like that. Uh, I'll, I'll take one more minute. So there is a question about um, how do we decide top ten. So there is a challenge that would come up there. As Santri mentioned, there is a survey at the end of this workshop. Then there's a survey at the end of tomorrow's workshop. And then there is a challenge that to, you'll get tomorrow. You work on the three things. We are going to collate your responses. We are going to understand how you've done it. And then we're going to select. I mean, initial, the first thing, I think, depending upon the kind of responses we get, we invariably try to select top 40. From those top 40, then they will be called for a presentation round. Then comes your when you're you're coming for your presentation round. Along with your idea, what matters is how do you present the idea. So pitch desk is also about you know presenting and sounding you know uh, convincing to your investors. So at that on that day, Sanjay would be the investor you know who's looking at your ideas. The other people who join us for the jury, they would be the people who would be looking at the ideas. So you have to present your ideas. Um, that is from there we are going to pick up top 10 and then from there top three also it's not just top 10 we are going to pick up top three too uh, where do we write the answers you will get to know about everything uh, once this is over stay there is presentation like a ppt or a voiceover uh, we'll come to that that's tomorrow so we won't bother much about it yeah, I know, Akrish, it's such a long time, you know, but but uh, you wanted us to cut it short. We couldn't do that. Um, I mean, I, I'm happy to skip a certain part, but then that's, that doesn't serve the purpose. Yeah, it's, it's uh, you know, this topic is, you know, if, Something if somebody... Something you do at three years graduation and you take time to do it in three days. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it, it's like a... 
if you think about the news nowadays uh, and you see like this one Financial Times article that is, you know, this long, you know, it's it's fake news. It's like one argument without any any depth and and any way to really critically think. And I know it's a, it's a long time and, you know, we have been going through this stuff lightning fast. I, I feel like we have been going way too fast. Certainly, but, you do. Yeah, but uh, but it, it's like um, like like Anamika greatly put. The idea is to you know understand you know ideas, understand about you know how to vet them, how to try them, how to test them, how to do your homework with math, how to understand, start building, understanding, and analyze markets. And now we are talking about next, like how you should be looking into how what you should keep in mind in terms of legal stuff and what you should be con, you know keeping in mind in terms of funding and you know, how can you plan all that so hopefully this gives you an overview of what's included and then when it's time for you to actually put all of this information into action then you would have sort of a framework in your head. So that's 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 the that's the point. And tomorrow we are practicing more on the pitching side and how to present. And this is all like the information that you can push into the pitch deck. But all right, let's. Uh... Yes. So we we have a our team, you know, including me, will will uh, choose the the best the people that will uh, pitch the idea and also you know who will receive the recommendation letters and all that. So. We'll share you all the information uh, about that. Now, let's take a warm up once more, once more looking at the chat uh, and looking for your ideas. In terms of arguments, let's say you have a couple of co founders, you might have an investor, you might have a partner, you know, a, some collaborator, maybe a distributor, reseller, maybe you are the reseller. What type of arguments or fights? or disagreements can you get into? What do you think? What type of arguments might be there that you encounter? Pitch is a sales talk. What type of arguments you might uh, come up with? You know, about, yeah, copyright. Good one. Sharing. It can be cost sharing as well. Equity. Right. A patent. Yes, or trademark. Ideologies, yes, just clashing ideologies, like red one. Trying to improve my typing. Yes, salary, just a product design. How do you identify good or bad partner? Really, really tough. Really tough question. Name, yeah. Company valuation. Ownership. Well, that's similar to equity distribution, but ownership in general in other different board. Yeah, board members, like a board composition. Definitely. No funding in different ways you know yeah like uh taking a loan like credit taking credit how do you know if your partner is uh well that's that stuff that's the only 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 conversations can help yeah ethics earnings number of shares licensing yes a license can be that 
Okay, some some uh, things that are already here, so I try to uh, take the new ones. Repaying loans, yes, loan repayments, innovation, yeah, like <clears throat> that's what type of fights <laughs> disagreements you found negative feedback getting some license you know hires hiring new hires and fires firing people <clears throat> Execution, valuation, trust. Trust is, you know, lack of trust. Yeah, distribution of share, office location, yeah. Yeah, uh, you know, just like uh, roles, like posts of people. Corruption, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yes, office location is there. Time, just like a time spent. A lot of things, just any type of contracts, logo design, it, 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 yes, great. Like all of these, high, highly possible, highly possible. It's It can be even possible that you encounter all of these problems <laughs> during your, and your agreements during your uh, entrepreneurship uh, journey <clears throat> and especially when you are winning it tends to be easy to negotiate but when you are failing then some of these conversations might be really tough yeah strategy ideas marketing all kinds of things <clears throat> now let's look into some legal considerations you have an idea what should you agree when already like you are discussing an idea uh you are investing an, investigating an idea what legal related things should you consider there are successful one-man projects for example flappy birds game and there are others but many ideas are built in teams <clears throat> Depends on your idea. I'm sure you can definitely patent. Yes, so <clears throat> I have an idea. Yes, so good good question. Can I patent protect my idea? Yeah. If you if you need funds how to get funds if needed. Following your, yes, checking if the idea already exists is protected. Yeah, so there is there are there are a few, but now one really important uh, thing is that when you come up with an idea, it is your idea. The intellectual property is owned by you, and uh, it is very important, especially if you want to get an investor because they cannot invest in you. I mean, I can give you money and say that, hey, this is for you. No strings attached. Fine, but you will not any pay dividend back in any case at any moment. So now it's important that if you build something that is in your head that you are building under your own name, that if you want an investor in the future or maybe co-founder, it's important to move the ownership to the company. 
So the company where investors invest in is the one owning all the important stuff. So everything is there in that basket. So that's something important. Yes. So let's put in domain. Good one as well. Putting some new ones as well. Cool. Now, especially if and when you are finding co-founders and you are working in a team, it's extremely important that if you plan on making the idea into a business, you agree preferably on a paper that all of the innovation and ideas and all the work we have now done moves to the company that is going to be established. You can make that type of agreement already way before the company is actually established. If you are worried that, you know, no, if you are making a commitment to build something, there are commitments coming from other people and you want to protect that idea you are building. Then the only way is to then move that to a company and then the co company owns everything and the individuals own nothing. That's, it sounds brutal, but that's just the way to protect the company and the idea and also be able to be you know, investable. And of course, you know, finding co-founders and all that, it's a long discussion. You know, you need to know these people, you need to build trust, especially, you know, Indian culture is more trust focused than, for example, in Finland. In Finland, we have more like, hey, let's agree this on a paper type of uh, work. Uh, but I would say that in India, it's like, 95% of trust and 5% about the paper. But if an, especially if a foreign investor, you know, international investor, you know, is interested in your idea and your, your company, it just has to be, the structure needs to be that everything is owned by the company. And you will, as a person, you will lose the ownership of the idea, but of course you will get in return ownership of the company that owns the idea. But now we come to a very interesting uh, point, like the shareholder agreement. And I don't know how many of you have ho heard about that, but that's one of the key paperwork that every company needs to do. Uh, and that's basically the rules of you and your co-founders, how you are going to work together. Yeah, like somebody is already posting like equity investing uh, uh, periods and all that. So we, we come back to that, never give too much equity and all that uh, in, in a moment, but you need to keep in mind that let's say, 100% of nothing is still nothing. 50% of something is much more than nothing. So let's say if you are really trying to build something ambitious, uh, ambitious you just need the co-founders and you need the resources. And in order to succeed, in order to have the value, you know, your ownership of the company will dilute. That's just how it is. So now, when we are looking into the, you know, the setting up the business, uh, like I said, company owns everything. There has to be no loose ends. So the structure is, and this sounds brutal, is that if people want to jump out, if they want to leave the business, if they don't want to be involved in anymore, you know, they lose everything, pretty much. Everything there are asterisks to that. Of course, if somebody has worked already, let's say two, three years, it is clear that something should be there, like maybe money for them to leave when they leave, or maybe there is some ownership that they keep, like the vesting that, that uh, somebody mentioned. But now typically in every case, there is a clear cut that the company stays it still owns everything and people coming and going just own the shares 
and also if somebody quickly visits maybe for half a year they normally don't get anything so just something that there should be no loose ends in the company so the investor or you who is putting everything on the line in order to make this business work it cannot be that the company fails because of some you know rotten egg you know getting out of the company for example and that prevents you from maybe getting more funding because of you know contractual stuff that has been put in so you need to be very careful of that now some things that typically are considered in a shareholder contract we are not going to details but just for you to get an idea of what's there so you know what type of standard shareholder agreements tend to agree on is for example if somebody else wants to sell their shares of the company meaning that you know maybe somebody needs money needs to share there is a thing called right of the first refusal which means that if somebody wants to sell the other co-founders and the company has their first chance to purchase the shares before somebody outside uh, can can buy typically anybody who owns anything from the company needs to sign the shareholder agreement so everybody is under the shareholder agreement no matter what now of course it uh, discusses things like if somebody wants to leave means that wants to you know live in in good faith has a better things to do or somebody has to leave in because of getting fired or something else so these are discussed in the shareholder contract also situations like the company is getting bought like in which terms everybody has to sell their shares typically it's like if you know 66 percent two-thirds of the uh, of the shares are being sold the rest need to sell as well there are typically clauses like that and also if there is companies taking a loan how many need to agree if there's a new co-founder who joins in which terms they you know join who is the ceo who is the how is the company managed and now something that somebody already mentioned the vesting so very typically the co-founders vest, vest their shares and what they mean what that means is that they are going to be there for about two years and during that two years when they finish their two-year period they have all their shares that they originally had so if they now leave they would keep their shares typically what happens though is that if there is a major new founding round raised for example let's say in seed funding stage we're going to those in a, in a moment if at seed funding stage uh, people vest their shares for two years and you are successful and you are raising a series a like an acceleration round like a very big maybe millions of dollars that you are raising typically that investor wants to vest all your shares once more so they know that you are going to be working there or if you leave you lose your shares very common practice so be pre prepared to you know keep on working also very typically there are no compete uh you know hiring restrictions confidentiality confidentiality and things like that so these are very typical shareholder agreement cons considerations uh i can share you a uh, a link called series seed.fi so maybe let me so this link this has a typical uh templates for startups in europe especially in northern europe what type of standard documentation they use so if you want to go through what type of agreements are there and you want to observe more closely how these are written in that's uh, something you can do but these are there i don't want to go into details but these are all there to protect you and your work put into the company 
So if something bad happens, meaning somebody leaves, somebody wants to take over the company in a hostile manner, you can prevent it. So these are there because of that. All right. So let's look into uh, a bit more. So typically, all of these shareholder contracts and all this, this needs to be ready if you want to get seed money. Typically, people take either loan if company is profitable to some extent or convertible note that you know, loan that can be converted into equity or they might have equity investment. We are going into details with how you want to maybe plan that and grants. Typically with these uh, come an investment agreement that then, for example, requires you to do certain things on the shareholder contract side or maybe gives the investor some veto rights. For example, they can have one board member or they can decide if you can take in more money or not. There might be some veto rights there. Something to keep in mind. Also, typically at this stage, people, you know, when you are, have set up the business, if there are trademarks, for example, or patents you want to file, it's a good time to do that. And remember that if you own patents yourself, the company needs to have those patents, either in a way that you have unrevocable forever license for the company to use your innovations or the company outright owns the patents that you have created. So this is something that, of course, if it's necessary, needs to be taken care of. And an investor will not, most likely, will not accept a situation where a company is rel reliant on a patent that is not in the company possession. Just keep in mind that every egg needs to be in that one basket, which is the company. The simpler, the better. Of course, at some point, you need to figure out you know, your sales and how, what type of sales agreements you are doing. You need to uh, build your terms of service and terms of use and your privacy policy. Especially in Europe and United States, these are very important. Some you know, legal things that will come your way. Now, there are experts that will help you with this. So of course, I'm not going to the details, but remember that when you are starting to sell things, you need to set the terms, how people are going to use your product, and you need to set the terms, how you are going to keep their data, especially in Europe and United States. Then there is one more thing. I know that I'm once more going pretty fast, but I'm just wanting to go there, give you the overview of different things that will happen and come up is the options. And options are typically something that a company has maybe seven to maybe 15% of option pool in the equity. Meaning that if there is a you know, worker or co-founder or CEO or an advisor or somebody else who you want to reward, you want to involve them, you want to motivate them, typically it's the options that you are giving out to those people. So they are part owners of your company. Keep in mind that these options are also part of the shareholder contract. So option holder is also a party in the shareholder contract. So all of these terms also apply to option holders. And if and it's typical that options are vested as well. So people that give options need to work for a certain period of time in order to vest their options. All right. Then one thing that the last thing that I want to mention here, of course, there are multiple outcomes that might come up. So uh, you may go for an IPO or, you know, getting like a massive round or you might go and scale your company or you might go bankrupt, whatever. Of course, I'm not going to details with this because these are something that you you in this moment, you have expert help in order to get everything correct. So let's just focus on the very beginning. But uh, one thing 
when you typically with the with the seed investment and pre-seed investment the terms are relatively simple like you get money uh, of course shareholder agreement needs to be there there might be some veto rights for example you cannot take a massive loan before the uh, without the investor agreeing but then when you are moving into the bigger money territory meaning maybe hundreds of thousands of usd or even millions of usd uh, it's a very typical thing to the investor to require more heavier veto rights. For example, for more investments or board members or CEO or options, things like that. So there might be a huge list of veto rights that, that people may ask. So all of these are negotiable, but uh, please keep in mind that, you know, these veto rights might come up in your negotiations for money. One thing that I would be very careful about is a thing called preferred stocks. And what this means is that there is like a series A shares and then the common shares. Typically in many uh, business laws and company laws are across the country, all shares need to be equal. So the only difference is that with the Series A share, if the investor has invested 1 million USD to a company, before, and, and, and let's say the company is sold in six months from that investment, the investor first gets their million back and then the rest get whatever is left and of course you know per share so what can happen with this is that let's say you get an investment of 10 million you have worked for 10 years and you have just closed a investment round of 10 million the investor has preferred stock and they have invested 10 million so at the beginning if you get acquired or sold, they get their 10 million back and then the rest get whatever is left. What if the sale price is 11 million or 10 million? Then the investor gets their 10 million and then the remainder gets whatever is left. So your 10 years will be you know, wasted in terms of making money, at least. Probably great experience, but uh, money-wise bad investment of time. So now these preferred stocks might be, come as a surprise. So please be careful and think about your business thesis really carefully before entering into a preferred stock agreements and basically you know, allowing you to go into those pitfalls. Ex um, okay, so options again. So uh, quick recap on options. So option is typically, let's say Santeri owns 50%, Anamika owns 40%. We have decided to leave 10% as options of the company ownership. Now, uh, let's say Raghav is joining the company as an employee, but Raghav is a great CEO or CTO, and we want to invest and reward Raghav for, for the work. So now we can give Raghav, let's say 3% of our option pools as, as options. So Raghav would then during the next, maybe depending on the vesting period, maybe during the next year or two years, vest his options. And after a couple of years, he would own 3% of the company equity. So this is basically, the best motivational way for you to reward your best uh, people around you. All right. Any questions about the legal legal thing? I know once more, really quick overview of what's there. <clears throat> really key takeaways. Who owns the IP? Who owns the idea? It needs to be the company. So make sure that company owns everything important. Make a shareholder contract. 
there are a lot of templates, a lot of good lawyers out there that will help you with that. You know, do your trademarks and patents if needed. <clears throat> Remember that in order to uh, avoid fights with your customers, remember to set the terms of use and terms of service and use of data. And then be careful about preferred stocks and veto rights. And you know, remember to reward your best people around you through options plans, because this is the way how you make people to feel like this is my thing. So if you own something, you are more happy to work for it. So prefer stocks, it, it is not necessary. So if, you're, if, you, if you are doing a phenomenal business, then I'm sure you have an option not to take preferred stock money in. But very typically is that very typical, like why series A is called series A? Like we, we normally say that, you know, seed, you know, there is pre-seed funding, there is seed funding, series A funding, series B, C, D, and so on. Typically, when it comes to series A, that round gets the series a shares there which sometimes has the preferred stocks and then series b adds another layer of stocks series c so in the worst case scenario <clears throat> let's say exit price is 100 million whopping 100 million usd but the series c investor has put in 50 million they first get their 50 million back Series B investor has put 40 million. They first get their 40 million back. Series A get their 10 million back that they have invested. This is a hypothetical situation. But it can be that through this preferred stock arrangement, of course, for the investor to protect their money, the founders get nothing. And, and this is, there is a massive edtech company called K. Newton that this exact thing happened. Acquisition price, 108 million. Last investment round, Series D, $100 million with preferred stock. You know, that's it. The guys was, were working for this for 15 years. They really got nothing out of that at the end. So please be careful. So is it really important to have a co-founder? I mean, if you really want to have people to really work hard with you on something, the co-founder is is the way to go <clears throat> and you know the people that you trust the best people the smartest people those should be your co-founders they don't need to be your friends they need to be your colleagues that you trust and that are experts in what they do all right so very quick overview to law now, I am not a general counsel. I'm not a lawyer. <clears throat> These are stuff that I've been going through myself a couple of times. So best of luck with, with all this. Uh, <clears throat> and of course, internet is full of examples, templates, about different versions, because many things can be written in a very different ways to favor the founder or favor the investor. Any questions about the legal side? I know that is a very quick overview, but just to give you a perspective to this. So uh, for the for the question, so is it confusing? Uh, like the if if you don't have a patent, can you get money? But you need money to file a patent. Yes. Uh, now <clears throat> there is it's a chicken and egg problem. So obviously, if your company requires a patent, uh, then quite I would say that some options are out there. For example, universities might help you with that. So for example, our university, Satakunta, has a, a special fund that pays our students patent applications. So that's that's one way of doing that. Of course, family, friends and fools, meaning <laughs> 
you know, somebody brave enough to invest into your business could be one. And of course, just having the trust, going to the investors, saying that, you know, you have this idea, it needs to be patented. And, you know, expect that, you know, they believe your idea, your pitch, they believe in you. And then, you know, you get the money to file the patent. So what if you get invested stocks, not for the money, but for the mentor? What do you, what do you mean by that? Well, I mean, uh, we are now talking about uh, unlisted company equity. Uh, so of course, um, looking at stock market is a very different thing for the Startup is always a very bullish thing. So, so how much powers a co-founder has? Now, everything in company is based on the ownership of equity. And of course, the veto rights that might be there for an investor or for a founder. It could be that way as well. Now, it's very typical that the, the, this is this depends on the corporate law. So now this is different to India than it's to Finland. But for example, in Finland, many things can be decided with supremacy, meaning that if there is like 50 percent, 50.01 percent of shares vote X, it wins. So. If, if you want to keep control of your company, if the co-founders want to keep the control of their company, they need to own more than 50% of the shares. All right, but let's let's look into the, the money, money side next. Uh, because I'm sure that a lot of your questions, I mean, all of this is in a way interconnected, like all of this is interconnected to funding as well. And we can start from this. So really, when we talk about startups in general, quite often we, we, we you know, people expect that you are racing for a massive exit of billions of, of dollars, and you might be doing that. But your end goal be, can be more than that. It could be that you want to have fun. You want to do something that you know, has meaning, is doing impact, you know, might change the world. You, know, you might want to make a whopping uh, load of money or you know, a combination of that. And I think that for a lot of us young people, I still include me, categorize me as young, at least relatively young. I think that best things for me is like where I can actually, you know, sustain myself, make make some money, but at the same time, you know, do something that is meaningful and has impact, you know, you know, to people and and to, you know, things surrounding me, which is, you know, based on my values of course. So now, if we think about, you know, the life cycle funding, these questions should guide us to what type of investment opportunities we use because naturally a typical vc like a venture capitalist investor or angel investor they are there to make money they invest investors money and they want to make a return for their investment makes makes sense there can be investors that uh, invest in order to make social change and they don't expect to make that much return to reinvestment. Or there might be people that just give out grants just in order to you know, make the world better or help you as a young entrepreneur. There might be different, there are different entrepreneurs, there are different investors, you know, everybody you know, pursuing whatever reason they, they might be pursuing. So this is something that, uh, that, that we should keep in mind when, when we talk about this. So now, like really the key takeaway here. So I have a you know a bit of a, a bit of a path here, and remember that every single business is different. Now this is just one 
way to look at it, one path. This is hypothetical, your path might be different. Let's look into what those opportunities might be. But this is the key takeaway here. So I've been following, mentoring, helping so many you know, young entrepreneurs that are starting a company from university or just starting a company around me. And a very common phenomena that applies to people is that, um, what do you mean by social change? So social change meaning like, uh, let's say I wanna decrease poverty. So decreasing poverty might not be a lucrative business, but it's a very important thing to do. So that's a social change. If you can make impact to reduce poverty, that's a social change. I mean, I guess you could make social change to worse, but not that many people are aiming for that. Some, I'm sure. But going back to the phenomena, like, uh, like it's very common to see that uh, people work, they work hard and then things tend to just take care of themselves in a way that people go to investors and they're like, oh, well, well they didn't. In, they didn't invest, in, they didn't like, I, they thought I'm too early, they didn't believe in the idea, whatever reason. But when they have just kept on working, you know, things have progressed, the business has progressed, maybe there is a deal, maybe there is prototype, maybe there is something else, or just that the entrepreneur, him or herself, has just shown effort in building the business and have done work to you know, progress that. Then all of a sudden, the message changes and all of a sudden these companies are investable or they start making business or they start making agreements and, and sales. So really the background current of taking your company and idea forward is you and your team members working. And the, like the more and longer you work, you constantly are increasing your odds for everything else that you might need. So it's like a common mistake is to think that, okay, you know, I need, a, I need, a, I need money in order to build my idea. That's wrong because so many things can be done without money. You just need to work. Anna, I guess there's something you want to mention. Yeah, so there, there is uh, somebody who's spamming the entire chat asking, can we start the business, uh, be, uh, be an entrepreneur at the age of 17? I actually, first of all, please don't spam. Secondly, you can be anything at any age. You, it is irrelevant right now. If you, if you read about Warren Buffett, he started his own enterprise, his trading, you know, thing at the age of for what uh, I think he was uh, nine. By the time he was 11 years old, he, he had filed for an income tax return too. So that is, uh, you know, there is no age for anything. But at the same time, please do not spam the chat. Yeah, I, I try to I try to follow the chat, but at the same time, I want to progress I know, I, the, I, the information. But so, sorry, sorry about, about that. Yeah. Yeah. So there, there's another question. How do you gain more funds and investment? Working, by working. It's just like you, you work on the, on the company, it, you step by step progress with your company and your idea. You do things that demonstrate to people, to investors, to people around you that you are serious, that this is going to work. And all of a sudden you will notice that the answers you are getting has changed and people are more accepting. This is just a, a like, for example, I've been mentoring very lately this, uh, uh, this guy who's building like a remote hospital. And a uh, long time, he was just like hitting his head against the wall, but just working in the background, you know, building, contacting doctors, contacting nurses, building the business, building the website himself. And all of a sudden, you know, it, the idea came investable. Uh, angels, you know, started liking, liking the idea. It, 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 it shifted. And it's just what tends to happen. Like, if you think about you being a young person, let's say 18 year old, and you have a pitch deck, like, would you actually invest money to, you know, somebody, you know, it's, it's like, a, if you think about, you know, all the investment opportunities in the world, would this young person with a pitch deck be the opportunity? 
you know, you need to show most likely something more than a PDF. So it's just like you work, you progress your idea, and all of a sudden you become, you are at the stage where they become interested in you. Or maybe you close the first sale or pilot or something else. So this is just like the background current that makes stuff work. And you shouldn't underestimate how much you can do without getting a single dime for your business. Yeah. And there, there's something else also. There was a question, sorry. Yeah. Um, somebody had asked a question is that it was about, uh, you know, the language skills that if we speak well, can we trick people into funding? Well, uh, we do not trick people into funding because unfortunately, the people who are going to invest in us, they are far more smarter than to look beyond what we are saying. So they, they are smart enough to look at the data that you are going to present and figure out immediately whether the data has been, you know, kind of manipulated or it is a bogus data. So it is it is like that, you know, uh, we, we it is not that the language skill gets you the funding. It's basically a lot of research, authenticity and genuinity of your idea that gets you the the funding. And also there's somebody who says that, you know, uh, in India, we do not have an environment of entrepreneurship. And uh, Warren Buffet was, was uh, is, a, is a U.S. citizen. Uh, well, to break the myth here, we uh, if somebody has uh, like read the news uh, last year, there's this guy called Tilak Mehta. He's a 13 year old who and a founder of Papers and Parcels. Please check check this guy. Then there is another one who is like um, a 22-year-old, uh, Sri Lakshmi Suresh, who's a founder of e-design and tiny logo. Then there's a 20-year-old King Siddharth, who's a founder of Friends. There's a 17-year-old Advait Thakur, who's a founder of Apex uh, Infosys India. Right? So there are plenty of such examples. Uh, if we want to give ourselves an excuse, that's a different story. But mm. in India also, we have plenty, plenty of opportunities to, you know, take these these ideas forward. And only thing that you have to be focused about is whether you're ready to work hard for it. As Anthony has mentioned that there is no shortcut to hard work. That's what you have to, you know, kind of uh, build in. Yeah. Uh, so uh, for, for the pitch deck, of course, Part of part of you and part of the opportunity in you and your business is your ability to communicate it, because we know that you know if somebody doesn't understand what the product is, it's really hard to buy it. But if it's a very well communicated product and you understand the value, it's of course easier to buy. So now, of course, that applies to everything else. So you need those presentation skills in order to communicate your great idea. But I wouldn't say that communication skills alone will, you know, cut it for you unless you are making maybe, let's say, a career as a comedian or a career as a expert salesperson, talk trainer. Maybe that's a different case. But let's let's look into, <clears throat> we now know that there is this background current of lots of work that goes into building a business. We know that. Then if we look at, at the beginning, the valuation might be zero of your idea. And at the same time, after a long while, it might be a lot of money. So, so this can be billions, of course, or it can be nothing. Now, I drafted a maybe a potential uh, sort of a flow of you building a, a business. It might be first an idea, which you turn into a pitch. You pitch it, it might you know iterate multiple times. It might turn into a proof of concept. Maybe that's on a paper, maybe that's a website, maybe that's some other design, some other product that you have created. Then there might be a prototype, there might be a product, there might be a technology, there might be actual sales. This is like, let's put in sales because business is different. There is growth, <clears throat> there might be more growth. And of course there might be a bankruptcy or a failure somewhere. 
This is just one flow. Now, at which moment do you set up the company? It's up to you. As long as you remember that somebody needs to own everything. So in a way, legal wise, the thing is intact. But it could be that first you create a, po a proof of concept and then you pitch it. This is completely fine. Or maybe your idea is so amazing that straight away from an idea, you make a sale. Who knew? But this is possible. Oops, making a mess. Or it might be that you are, you know, making prototype already, you know, after your idea, or maybe, maybe the idea is actually a technology and you are creating this technology, you patent it, maybe you get funds from your school or from your family or whoever, you know, these routes might be completely different for everything. But this is one example. Your path might be different, but this is one example. But what I mean about planning your funding and your life cycle funding is to understand like what your end goal is and how much money you think you might need for each development stage. So let's say like a typically, like where do we need money here? Between these two, we might not need any money. We can make a PDF with our smartphone, right? Well, depends on what we know. Here, we can probably write the code. We can probably, you know, make a flow on a website without paying any money. There are free software for that. Okay, if we need development work, if we need manufacturing to make a prototype, we might need some money or we need a partner or we need a co-founder or somebody else or just a friend who can provide this to us. So this is this jump is also possible to do without money with communication skills, definitely. <laughs> but this is possible as well. Now, can we make a product without any money? Well, if it's me on a stage, maybe yes. If it's an app, maybe if it's a technology, it might be harder. It might be possible if you have good co-founder, if you have good coding skills, if it's a, it's a program, it might be possible. Well, sales, yeah, well, I mean, you can always just go and start calling people or maybe have a website, try to push it on social media. Maybe you can make sales without spending any money. Maybe even you can have viral growth. You don't need any money. So all of this can happen without any money. For Minecraft EDU, everything happened without any money. All the money that came in was from sales. So income funding. One example of you not to get stuck, do you get funding or not? It doesn't matter as long as you work, as long as you find alternative routes, you will figure it out. There are ways for you to progress your business even without making any money. And of course, you know, exit might require a lawyer that costs money. But if you are selling your company, you might be able to afford it. But this is one example. Let's say you are making cars. Obviously, you need money to build proof of concepts. You need money to build prototypes. You need money to product. You need money to probably advertise. Yes. Absolutely. So there are different ways. But now, uh, uh, proof of concept. So proof of concept is like a, it can be, let's say, a mock-up online about a service in the browser. So just a way for you to demonstrate how the concept would work for an audience, for an investor, part of a pitch, things like that. So it's a proof of concept. But now, really, the point for this is that, you know, if you don't get money, don't get stuck, don't get disappointed, the time will come, and then just figure out alternative routes. But now, when we are talking about the life cycle funding, 
Uh, let's think about this example. Let's say that our plan is to sell the company. Let's say that our task, our goal, sell the company as high with high enough as high as possible valuation in five years. Really, you know, ambitious. Let's go. Okay. Now, we want to maximize our, of course, how much money we make. Yes. But also, we need to make sure that we can actually sell the company. And that would require us to have the veto right from here or the equity ownership over the threshold, what might be 50%, in order to sell that we are selling. And then we also need, just to you know, give you the idea, we also, like, uh, if, if we want to sell the company, we need to have a drag-along clause for everybody else to also, they have to need their sales shares as well. Just, you know, a, 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 legal, a legal connection there. So, okay. Let's say that, okay, the criteria here, so we need 50% plus equity ownership by co-founders. So we can actually, as, as co-founders, we can now sell the company and no veto for a, anybody else sell uh, to say not to sell and then we also need a drag along so everyone needs to sell with us okay might sound complicated but this is the structure now we know our goal and we need this is the criteria we need 50 percent plus equity no veto and we need a dragon on course clause in the shareholder contract. So everybody needs to sell when we are selling. All right. So let's start planning. Now, in order to, so this is hypothetical, of course. Now, let's say we have the idea, we have the pitch deck, we might have the proof of concept already done, but for the prototype, we need money. Okay. We, prototype we cannot make without money. Let's see. If we spend 10% of our equity here, prototype stage, then when we productize, it's another 10% equity in order to get the sales going, another 10% equity. And in order to get the growth going, another 10% equity. Okay, once more completely made up hypothetical one possible way. Now this would mean that total with this logic, we would have burned 4% of our equity in investor hands. Okay. Now we know that we need to have it 50% or more. So we still have wiggle room there. It's very common that let's say at this moment when it's time to get sales and growth, actually what happens is product pivot. Very typical. So there is actually a detour of us needing to pivot the company to a certain extent, and this might cause another 10% equity burn. All right. Now let's now we have a buff 10% buffer for the pivot. We have 10% for sales, 10% for growth, and then we would have 50% equity in investor hands. All right. Fine. Now, how much money do we actually need? Now, in terms of this, we 
we are we are solid if if we can burn only 10 percent 10 percent 10 percent 10 percent and a maximum of 10 percent here we are okay with our criteria here now of course with the shareholder contracts and with our uh, veto rights we need to just push those into agreement by negotiating them all right now let's think about how much money we need let's say that for a prototype we need 100,000 USD. We need for a proto 100K USD. So quick math, what our valuation needs to be? Well, 10% equity. I assure you know, our valuation needs to be one million USD minimum. What is a prototype? Prototype is a like a mock product. Oh, no, not necessarily a mock product. It's like a how, how should I say like a like a prototype product, meaning that it's uh, before the mass production is like a prototype of what the product is going to be like an example of what the product is going to be. Yes. So one million. So this is the minimum. How do we reach 1 million with this, with all this? Of course, we need to do our homework. We need to have a good team. We need to, you know, do work in order to build the networks, build the, maybe the pre-sales, whatever we can do to make this look like a great investment. So we can increase the amount of valuation. If let's say if our valuation is two million, we would be you know spending only five percent, or we could raise two hundred thousand, which would give us a lot more resources to make this happen. So this valuation plays a huge role. But let's think if we would actually have if we would next step for for a product. Let's say for a product, we need. In order to get the production going, we need 500k USD. So now we would already require 5 million USD valuation. And now we would have 10%, 20% already burned from our equity. And now potential pivot, getting the sales going and all that. But now, Really, the key here is that you need to look into how can you increase your valuation, and and really, down rounds are challenging, meaning where you need to reduce the valuation between rounds. That's hard. That's hard to negotiate. It's really hard to negotiate. But so let's not overdo the valuations. But in a way, if you have your path ready here, like you have like an idea of, okay, how much money I need for prototype? How much money I need for product? How much money I need in order to get the sales going? These are all hypothetical, of course, for everybody, every one of us, we don't know how it will go. Then that will help you to create the thesis for the investor. So they know that like, what is, the money that you actually need, what is the money that you are going to be burning over the course of your, your journey? And you know, what is your end goal? It is okay to say to the investors that actually we are going to be, we plan on selling this company in five years and we are doing everything we can. I'm sure that they like that, the idea that you are going to be doing that. And of course, like if, if we think about like where this money, Let's say that, okay, in order to grow the sales, uh, uh, grow the sales, marketing, etc. Let me put a couple extra examples here. We need a million. If we want to be true to our plan, we need 10 million valuation. And then the final final one, let's say we want to really have a growth round, growth round of 5 million. All right, then we need already 
50 million. In here, everything sounds very easy. Yes. So if you're lucky, something like this will happen. But now, one, one more thing I want to wanna, wanna cover here. If we look at the different, different uh, rounds here. Now, this is just a mock-up, hypothetical, dancing on the roses type of uh, journey to sell your company in five years with, you know, with you know, pivot maybe being the only possible pitfall there. So let's discuss also like what the investors might be looking at when they consider the investment. Let's first of all name these different rounds. So this could be, oops, pre-seed. Meaning that pre-seed is money mostly for you to explore, build, and you know test the waters. Seed for product development. Series A for acceleration, the sales, getting the sales going. And then the first growth round, Series B. Right. Let, th th these are our names. These are, you know, industry standard names, pretty much for approximate times that this company. So pre-seed would be to build the prototype. Seed would be building the product and getting it out there, getting the market tested. Series A would be to get the sales going. Series B would be to get the sales growing and fast. All right. Now. If we look at what the investors are looking at here, the key thing is oh, founder. And in order to become a great founder, we once more come back to this. So you demonstrate how committed, how much work you are able to, you know, you are putting in how well you know the market, how well you have done your homework, all that. So pre-seed money and the family, friends and fool money here is about you, about the key founder, typically the CEO or somebody else. It might be two founders, but, uh, but really, or more, but the founder or founders, these are the key people. So most likely, this valuation is 90% based on you. And the idea, as we discussed, is just a sidekick. Because if people believe in you, they know that you will figure it out. You will make a successful business no matter what. So the first idea might not work, but the next one will. So seed, there's a question about seed. What is a seed? So we call it this a seed sort of planting the seed investment round so it's just a round final investing round name or capital raising round name so pre-seed seed series a series b these are all names for the different funding rounds we are raising i mean this example is raising not all of everybody is raising like i mentioned minecraft edu you didn't need any of this because the sales were so strong. Equity is company shares, company uh, ownership. So how many shares do you own? That's why we go, if, if you say equity investment, it's investment to the company shares. So buying the company shares. So if we look into the next phase, and yeah, good. So all of these questions are amazing because I'm not always translating myself. So please ask these questions. So pivot is your business looks first like this, and now it looks like this, or your business looks like this, or it looks like this. So idea is that you need to tremendously change your business model, your idea. And 
I wouldn't say that with Minecraft EDU we did. I mean, we had maybe two pivots. One pivot out of the training model. I was first discussing like doing trainings. Then we moved to selling licenses. First pivot, and then from selling licenses to SAS, SAAS, so SaaS Software as a Service business. That was the second pivot. So two pivots for us. Proof of concept, uh, it's a sort of a mock-up of your product and how it, it's going to be for people to have a quick experience out of that. So is a product pivot really necessary? Well, if you want to make successful business, yes. If, if, your, if your idea and your product doesn't work, then you need to pivot it. And I mean, if you are lucky, if you are super smart, maybe you don't end up doing a pivot, but most likely you are going to be doing a pivot, multiple pivots. But hey, if we look at the seed round, so seed is a seed. It's like a planting a seed where business will grow. So it's a metaphor. Uh, so let's say a seed funding round, that is typically the, the next founding round. So uh, where most likely some professional investors will already join. At that moment, the most important factor is the team. And if investors, they look at your pitch deck, they look at what you have achieved, they look at the team. Can this team with this track record achieve this? And based on that, the valuation and your chances are very heavily based on. Well, being in the future, uh, who decides the amount of royalty? Do we decide that the person we are selling the company to? So the, uh, the royalty uh, typically are something you can you negotiate with your reseller, or if you are a reseller, you negotiate with the you know the IP owner. But now looking at the series A and B, like let's let's look look at the last last two things here. Uh, so series A, then we are looking at the, the revenue, and this is not the revenue here. Doesn't mean it doesn't mean profit. It doesn't mean that you are making a profit. It means how your revenue is getting off the ground. As we are talking about Series A being the growth, you know, the, the acceleration and the first revenue round, we are just looking at how well you are able to start making money. How are you able to start making revenue? What is your plan on making the revenue? And finally, with Series B, unit metrics. So now it matters how much margin you are making from each sale you have. And then, of course, there are more rounds, but they, they are so far into the future that you will have expert people around you helping you when you get that far, for sure. But now, once more, I just want to say it that, you know, you don't necessarily need investment. All of these, in most cases, can be done without investment. This can be in different order for you uh, and, and all that. And really the background current is you hard working with the business. And these are just examples of investment rounds that could help you to plan your goal for the business. And like how much equity you can burn each round in order to maintain the control of your company. Can you decide that? No. Sometimes you can, sometimes you don't. You need to go with the flow. You know, market will act different than you thought. But this is one example how you could have a plan in order to be ready for whatever comes to you. So investors typically don't uh, uh, require Royalty. I, I know that there are examples of somebody asking, you know, some royalty payments, but typically investors own part of your company. 
And when we are talking about the 10% equity, so in at this stage, the, the investor would own 10% of your company. In this stage, the, they would already own 20% because 10 plus 10 is, you know, 20 and 30, 40 and so on. So very typically, uh, especially with growth companies and startups, uh, the only way to get funding is to sell or like uh, basically have new shares that you sell to that the investors will buy and will invest in your company. So a bit difference between equity and royalty. So royalty payment is, let's say if I'm selling, uh, let's say I'm selling Minecraft EDU, Minecraft licenses. So I might have an agreement that says 50% royalty for the game developer. So if I make 100 bucks, then I would basically pay 50, 50 bucks to the game developer and keep 50% for myself. So that's royalty. These are typically whenever you are borrowing somebody else's IPR, so intellectual property rights, somebody's intellectual property, you pay royalty to them in most cases, especially when you're doing business. Equity, on the other hand, is your company shares. So equity comes into play when, uh, you know, let's say if I own 100% of teacher gaming, and then there's an investor who wants to invest into teacher gaming. We come to an agreement and the investor uh, buys 10% of the company. And now one thing to keep in mind that typically the investors, they do not buy the shares from you. The company creates new shares and the investors buy the new shares and the money goes to the company, not to the individual, not, 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 to, not to the founder. Is there a business model which have a bit less of profit, but is up for a social cost and the investors consider it? Now, uh, there are investors out there that are particularly focused on social change and impact. So. I would say that if you want to build a company that aims for social change as part of their work, get in touch with those investors as your main priority. But I guess we can we can have uh, questions. I think that in our agenda, we do have our guest speaker coming up uh, pretty soon. Let's uh, quickly look at the agenda. So we are getting close to the story of a startup. Oops. There we go. So that's going to come up next. I think we have a bit of time. So happy to. I'm happy to keep on uh, answering your questions. If there's anything you would like to recap, happy to do that. Uh, and then if you want to take a break, if you want to you know, go and grab some coffee, Please do that, uh, and uh, let's have a Q and A session. And whenever, uh, when Satanik is is uh, back there, you know, feel free to take the stage. So, what if we don't get an investment? Well, I I try to elaborate there uh, that many of the first of all, I would say that there are very few businesses that you couldn't progress heavily without getting any money. So, so many businesses can be progressed in various ways without any money. And what typically happens with companies that I work with is that if they are not successful with raising funds, then they find an alternative way uh, to make the case better and more interesting for the in investor. For example, they might be trying to push for pre-sales they uh, push for to customers they contact customers they pitch the product as a pre-stage and they try to get agreements done in order to you know either do pre-sales to fund the development or just to demonstrate that this is an uh, a desired product which is more desired than as an investment as well so there are there are different ways to that but now let's say that, okay, there's a situation where you just, 
if you are not unable to, uh, able to get investment well either you are talking to the wrong investors or the business doesn't make sense and there is something you know foundationally wrong with that then it's uh, good to ask questions like what wh what is it that i'm doing wrong and why it is not investable uh, so but uh, there are cases uh, about that as well uh, sir could you explain pre-seed and seed money so uh, now these pre-seed and seed are just generic names that are used in the startup community for investment rounds so investment round is a a, 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 an event where, where one or more investors join to invest money into the company. Typically, the very first investment round is called pre-seed. And when the company is actually doing something really meaningful, for example, building a product or getting the product out, they call the, the founding round, seed funding round. These are just generic names for different funding rounds. Uh, how are your thoughts on the Shark Tank? Uh, in, in, in like three minute pitch, nobody will make an investment decision. Like it, it, it's, a, it's a lottery coupon after three minutes <clears throat> so it has to be that behind the shark tank they are doing due diligence much more rigorously than they are doing on the stage how is the net worth calculated of entrepreneurs well uh it depends on what type of network you are talking about if that's like a usd net worth uh it could be that you know the company valuation is taken into account and then the equ equity you own the percentage let's say if it's a 50 million company you own 50 percent then your valuation your net worth is 25 million if we have some ipr can we give it out to more than one company absolutely so it's based on the agreement so if you if you are licensing your product out you can just you know you don't have to sign any exclusivities <clears throat> so it can be that you retain the right to license the product and or the code to numerous people if there are somebody asking for exclusivity of course it can be territorial it can be for some specific segment you need to be very specific with this or it can be global but of course for global it uh, it needs to be a sweet deal in, in order to sign an exclusivity <clears throat> so yes link for the whiteboard how do i how do i share i'll, I'll share this to anamika and uh and and she can she can uh, share it to you so it's it will be available to you you can view it you can download it there is also this handy tool called business model canvas so you can use this to just look into you know different aspects sorry about the resolution it's a bit bad but uh, you can look into different uh, aspects of potential business and uh, this is a handy tool we use this business model kind of us uh, in our school as well just for you to think about you know different aspects that are, are key to business <clears throat> i just wanted to add, add it there because it's a good good tool Let me also follow the chat here. Uh, how to make customers understand what your product is? Re you know, a really tough question. Um, now, of course, the best way is to pitch and pitch and pitch and see what sticks, what something, what you know, wakes people up. Uh, what is the best way for you to communicate it? And uh, and you know iterations. That's uh, that has helped me. What's an acquisition? So acquisition is uh, an event where, for example, uh, another company buys the other. 
there are different types of acquisitions. Uh, but uh, typically, for example, what happened to Minecraft EDU was that Microsoft first bought outright Moyang, the, micro, the Minecraft creators, and then next they acquired the company building Minecraft EDU. So that's an acquisition. How to conduct survey globally? Uh, tough one. Um, maybe one way could be to have it, you know, Google Google AdWords. No, uh, it would be too expensive. But uh, <clears throat> my social media is probably the best one. But uh, I would look for partners. Depends on who you want to answer that questionnaire, uh, that survey. Just find organizations that are connected to that group of people and and try finding different routes, alternative routes to reach those people. How do you know what, uh, how do you know if the, if an idea is already out there? Uh, that's, that's a good one. Uh, Google is the best tool. Th this just, th that's, that's just a fact. Let me actually <clears throat> close my screen share. That's just a, that's just the best tool. Uh, of course, there are different patent searches. Some patent searches are free, so you can do you can uh, browse them at your own leisure. Uh, but it might be hard. You, it, it might require a bit of getting used to in order to find all the information that that you are looking for. Please explain about board members. So uh, typically the uh, the company management in most countries, I would say almost every country, is uh, it has well two main, uh, three main components. There is the annual meeting, there is the board, and there's the CEO. Where annual meeting typically is once a year, and things that annual meeting decides are things like selling the company. Uh, creating new shares, buying back own shares. You know, they decide the profit and loss statement and balance sheet. Like, are, do they approve that? They do things like that. So it's more like a, it's the the highest decision making body in a company. It's the annual meeting. You can see that all the stock comp, uh, share uh, the listed companies are sharing the annual meeting invites once a year. Then the board. Is the you know the more the executive function there that you know decide you know strategy they decide you know uh, fund allocation other things that and they decide you know what to do you know with some you know bigger decisions in the company and then the the person and the biggest director in the company the CEO is the one who implements and executes the strategy so. Hopefully that gave you an, an idea. And of course, the CEO uh, answers to the board, and the board can fire the CEO at any moment. And then the board prepares all the documentation and decisions for the annual meeting. Hope that gave you an explanation. OK, so what if there's a breach of trust in the co-founders? <clears throat> so hopefully at that moment you have that shareholder agreement in place so you have basically how you are going to work from now on so like uh the shareholder contract or the agreement is like an extension of trust so if if you run out of trust and you need to maybe get rid of somebody or you want to leave yourself then those are the terms that people can you know, come back and uh, join or leave. And then of course, if there is a more like, a, how should I say, like more practical problem, then one way to do that is that, you know, first of all, the CEO can you know, uh, do a decision or it can be the board who decides how we wanna, you know, uh, how, how we wanna continue from here. Or if it's a really big thing, uh, that, for example, requires all the shareholders and company owners on the same table, 
maybe it's uh, you know even at the at the annual meeting where something like that is decided. But uh, obviously, if it's like a two two people working uh, hard and uh, there are no investors, things like that, and there's a lack of trust, you know, those are tough situations. And and you know, how do you start building back that trust? These discussions, you no know, reflections, trying to understand the other person's view, and then making a decision decision how we are going to go forward from here. And if that doesn't work, then how do we part ways? And of course, those typically need <clears throat> agreements in place. So how do we increase our company's valuation during different investment rounds? By working, by hard work. Uh, so depends on what you want to achieve. Let's say, let's say you uh, raise funds to get your product to the market. Of course, the more you work on your product, the better it is, the better it's tested, the better the markets are tested, the better you know uh, pre-sales you might have accumulated, uh, better exposure, better social media following, like all of these small things all feed into the valuation. Amazing idea that, and the idea requires a lot of money to be put in. Well, uh, of course, without knowing the idea, f first of all, like just chatting with people that are smart, that could maybe suggest some, some way that it could be tested without investing the money. But I mean, if you are building a quantum computing, a computer, I mean, I guess you can always, uh, you can prove the math on, the, on a paper. And, and do a lot of things on, on a paper, but uh, but uh, yeah, of, of course, big manufacturing undertakings require investor quite often. So it is it is it can be a hard conversation, tough conversation and negotiation if you don't have a track record to demonstrate that you know what you are doing. But uh, the only way to find out is to have those conversations. Uh, <laughs> how do we see it through the loopholes in the contract? Well, uh, I, I am sure that it, it's uh, it's whenever there are humans talking to each other and agreeing on things, it will never be perfect. And I think that's the cool part of humanity, because we are so so random. Uh, but uh, I would say that. If you are not, if you are not using a lawyer, for example, just using standard templates that are well and truly tested uh, can be one one way. But I'm sure that if you are really trying to <clears throat> screw somebody over, I'm I'm sure that there are very few waterproof contracts. And even I've uh, been getting like from United States, for example, contracts that are tens and tens and tens of pages long. And they and it's so complex that it's um, impossible for people to follow. So they fall, they fail because of their complexity. So it's a, it's a tough question. I mean, of course, trust is like, I don't think that in many cultures, the only way to have contracts is to have trust. And very few cultures do contracts without trust. So it's still the contracts are a good fail safe in a way like the, like a fallback plan, but really the conversations, negotiations, and trying to find a resolution without using the contract is, is the best practice. But uh, not always possible though, but uh, it is really hard to find, con find or write contracts that are exhaustive because there might be some thing that happens that you just didn't expect and then you don't have a way to decide or you don't have a contractual clause to guide your way then only trust remains <clears throat> so how are board members selected um, typically uh, in the company sort of an articles of association meaning like the company establishing you know, the papers that were used to establish the, comp the company. There are mentioned that how many board members are, are there. 
And in the shareholder contract, there might be a mention that let's say there is at least one member from the founders. The CEO is one member and maybe there is a one member from everybody who owns more than 20%. There might be like guidelines like that. And then of course, people amongst them then decide who the board members are. Uh, of course, the investors, especially if somebody puts in a significant amount of money, owns over 10%, for example, they typically want a board seat. So then in the investment agreement, there is a, uh, a clause that then gets a one board seat for the investor as well. So this is, and of course, the investor can appoint anyone. And uh, how they are related to the founder, just uh, adding that. So typically founders have board seats because they are the majority owners, typically. Not all founders want to be part of the board. Uh, and of course, I mean, the founders are employees of the, of the company. So the board decides a strategy that let's move that way and the, the co-founders want to go that way. Then obviously the co-founders being employee as well as co-founder, they need to go the way the board decides. So. In that way, they are very well related. So turning ideas into reality, a possibility without the technical skills you should know, or hiring others to also equally feasible. Well, my experience for this is that I would say the key, the key, key tech people you should uh, invite as co-founders. For example, I had Alexi at the beginning, who was a tech guy, I was the business guy. So I would recommend with the key people following that. But of course, uh, there are super smart people out there that, that work for salary, that work for options, whatever it might be. So I would say that finding smart, pe smart people, trustworthy people is the, is the key thing. And then everything else, you know, everything is equally feasible, but you know, it's very handy to have a good tech guy or tech girl with you in the founding team. Hello. Thank you very much for all the you know patient answers that you've been giving. <laughs> we'll come back to the questions later. Uh, right now we have the speaker for this particular time. Now we have Shortanik Roy with us, and um, um, Shortanik comes with a lot of achievements that you know that are inspiring. So he's a mechanical engineer who's turned into an entrepreneur, and. He started out like like the famous entrepreneurs from the dorm room. So he's he built up Hyper Exchange and which is growing into several millions of dollars valuation. He has authored the classic retreat of anarchy and I met the demon. He completed his post graduation from Stanford University. He has featured over CNBC, Danik Jagran, Business Today, and several other media platforms. Um, he's a principal in, uh, investment partner. And he's also Forbes 30 under 30, India and Asia's 21st. Welcome uh, to the session, Shatanek. Thank you for your time. And uh, we look forward to hearing about your journey. Thanks, Anamika. It was great hearing you, Sandeli. Like, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> uh, great answers, honestly. I, I was uh, just hearing you for the last 10 to 15 minutes. It was great. Uh, great session. See here. Thank you. But hey, I'll shut my mouth and uh, take the backstage and looking forward to hearing <laughs> what you guys have. Yeah, looking forward to connect with you later. Yeah. Uh, hi, guys. Uh, uh, you know, like Anamika has already mentioned a great, great uh, intro. Thank you for that, Anamika. Uh, I am Shortanik. I run a startup called Hyper Exchange. Uh, it's, it's been several years right now. It's been five years right now since we started out of my college dorm room, now scaled across geographies, uh, you know, across US, uh, UK market. We are looking forward for the European market, which got delayed to the COVID and the pandemic, right? And a couple of my personal interests lies, of course, like we have several patents, so product development, product research, R&D, those are the couple of things I am keen towards and has al have always been focused towards, you know, while building hyper exchange. And, uh, and the scale story, uh, it is today, right? We, we are a deep tech uh, R&D, in the refurb market, right? A market which uh, which which was ninety five percent of gray, so it was a eighty billion dollar market, right? That uh, seemed to be a great great opportunity for say say for example today's uh, today's um, the 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 next generation technology that could be evolved into and probably we can create a market, right? Uh, and apart from that, you know, uh, this Ajax is my second startup. I. I started another startup when I was when I was in the first year of my 
grad uh, i was 18 back then it was a fintech and uh, uh, like uh, we sold it off uh, within 16 months it was a deep deep tech where we were uh, we were doing uh, b2b algos for for bank to bank transactions and uh, that's a quick background about myself uh, uh, i am very enthusiastic about writing i love writing so any questions on that side happy to answer looking forward so uh, we would like to know about uh, what led you to be an entrepreneur and not be a you know somebody who has a stable job who has a fixed in salary coming to your account at the end of the month what is it about you know the journey what okay my major question that i have been getting in the chat is you know in india there is no startup culture and children cannot do it because parents don't support what do you think about <laughs> uh so couple of things so I'll, i'll answer the first question first right uh i a start up by not a regular job but uh so interestingly uh like uh, i started very early in my career i started uh, when you know we did not even have placement offers so our placement offers begins from the third year of my college i started my first startup the first year of my college right uh and that was because of the fact it was also the era when the first startups in india were actually happening so there were two uh, two guys out of their uh, out of their flats creating something you know delivering to people in rain and now created a fiction company called flipkart right uh, it was the early age of flipkart you know we we uh, we then just had one uh, one uh, startup that that went on to become a unicorn it was inmobi so i met this guy very enthusiastic in bangalore right uh speaking about highs and the lows of his life but uh, i heard one of uh, one of his story where he went on to meet an investor in us and he had one side ticket so basically he just uh, because he could not afford the back ticket so basically he had one side ticket and his idea was if i get the investment i'll come back to india else i'll probably just shake up a, a job over there maybe in a cafe or something right and then figure out how to come back to india right so those are the inspirational stories behind uh, which which probably makes you feel So there is lot more we can explore in life than probably just ha- just having a job role which allows us to you know do just one certain thing say one certain project or say work on one certain value and aspect we can probably in case you are starting a startup of your own you'll, you'll get to you know taste everything you'll probably get to taste uh, taste your knowledge in finance or taste to get to taste your knowledge in um, say say how to how to build relationships this might be say investors this might be your customers clients etc right and and definitely supply chain this that so basically you get to taste uh, taste uh, taste everything out there right even legal and everything right so end of 5 years even if you are failing it's great maybe like see 99% of startups fail so even in, in end of 5 years or say 3 years whatever time you are giving uh, giving your life into this and it may fail right even then it may fail so even if it fails once you are out of it and you are going to a going to for a job placement where you are saying say i probably did my masters i probably did my phd and here you are saying you know i managed a group of people there were 300 people reporting directly to me i built this uh, uh, build this company from 0 to 10 million dollar uh, say valuation or say growth revenue whatsoever and then we failed right so basically where you just go out uh, go out with a simple job opportunity that they would probably give you a fixed salary here you are going to say you know i can build this uh, company from uh, say this is a part of the business i i am interested in i'll grow this on my own today you probably have a 10 million dollar revenue over here i'll grow this to 100 million dollar revenue in next 100 uh, in next 10 years or say next 5 years or whatsoever the time uh, time period right And so basically, I'll, I'll not take a regular salary, but once I grow this to a hundred million dollars, I'll probably take fifty million dollars out. Right? That's the way you can go tomorrow and pitch uh, for a job interview, even if you are failing. Right? I think that there's always a great opportunity. It's not that you cannot go back to a regular job, but you can go back to a job which pays you higher and gives you much more potential than it is today. And uh, Anamika, to your second question, uh, convincing parents, right? i think convincing parents is probably the is is the minutest hurdle you will probably ever face in the entire journey right uh, just to give you a, a sense of the uh, of of my journey 
correct right? so we we raised uh, several millions of dollars in value uh, like uh, in investments from big names uh, like uh, the mahindra group anand mahindra has invested in hx uh, cp gunan the ceo of tech mahindra who is india's highest paid ceo sits on my board uh, so basically someone was asking about the board members uh, board uh, thing just uh, in the in the last previous session so cp sits on my board uh, microsoft has an investment in hyper exchange all those things happened right uh, over a period of time jp morgan has investments uh, the the asia head of ub group united breweries has an investment uh, in hx so basically even when we raised you know uh, several uh, million dollars uh, uh, investment uh, there was a certain time due to some errors due to some you know some mistakes uh, we had a cash crunch and now say for example when you are just probably by yourself building a team uh you know you even if you do not pay those early two three employees is fine you can probably just go, reach out to them and say you know i'm sorry uh, i i won't be able to make your salary uh, this month because we do not have any sales but now think about the time you have 300 plus employees and you have a, a cash crunch where probably the next investment you are making needs to be make, uh, made towards the investment to make uh, to probably survive the company and there are 300 people who has their families who have their careers etc now totally betting will you be able to make the right decision once again and take it forward right so you know uh, it's not about crossing the first hurdle uh, there will be bigger hurdles as you, as you grow and scale right and so, so basically i feel convincing parents is the probably the least hurdle and if you are not able to convince your parents right i i don't think you'll be able to convince any investor or any any customer to to be very honest absolutely right i mean i i thought about it about it after asking that you know yeah that's that true you know parents are the first people that you know first obstacle but once you cross that there's no looking back i guess because then they are they support you fully that's also another you know definitely, good definitely. thing about a family yeah uh, so what is a what is hyper exchange all about the children want to know that uh all right uh, so uh, as said uh, right I, i gave a brief introduction i'll probably go deeper so we started hyper exchange so hyper exchange was not the original idea to be very honest so when i was in my college uh, i realized uh, say for example uh, you know uh, uh, say the final years who are moving out they are probably looking forward to you know get uh, get the books the the mattresses as well as everything sold out and those are the common things that first years need right Uh, be it in national colleges or be it in even in international colleges because of ragging etc there is a huge issue to connect the first years with the final years because yeah and they are super super seniors right you probably know your seniors but knowing your super super seniors take a lot of credibility not everyone can cross that hurdle but how about creating a platform within colleges right uh, where probably this transaction is made easy secure or whatsoever uh while while uh, while thinking in deeper then we realized the biggest hurdle over here is logistic how how do you really move a bag which is say what are uh, 20 kgs right and probably across floors probably across buildings whatsoever logistic will be a great hurdle so we said you know we'll probably do with one thing that is logistically easy and then we chose mobile phones right that's so light right you can just carry it in your phone in your pocket and that is when we also realize the highest per square inch value of any device is a mobile phone so you can probably fit a 1 lakh rupee card in your garage but fitting a 1 lakh rupee phone just needs a pocket so the per square inch highest per square inch value of any device is a mobile phone that's why we focus on mobile phones than any other device or any other say things uh, going down the line that was the first move towards building hyper exchange then we realized like it was there were the second hand markets all across the world right you probably have a khidipur market in kolkata you probably have a gafar market in delhi you probably have a lamington road in a, in a, in a, in a bombay so on and so forth if you look at this market uh, it's a 80 billion dollar market as of today 95% of this market is green all right so there there's no taxation there there's no uh, transparency into this and we realized this could be a huge opportunity this could be a huge opportunity as in also the fact today import of refurbish in india was banned we we are now in the process of lobbying with the government because we have you know so we have something very interesting called the faraday faraday is uh, faraday solves an entire supply chain and entire transparency process 
So it's a device. I'll, I'll give you the, the, it has different versions. I'll give you the example of a retail uh, version of Faraday. Over here you come, it's like an ATM machine. You place your device, the device goes in, it shows you what is the price of the devices and what is the issues with the devices. You accept, the device goes in, cash comes out, you reject, the device comes out. Right? Today, I am utilizing this Faraday. So this Faraday has different versions, as I said. This was the retail version I just spoke to you about. See, and at times we procured thousands of devices at a single point of time. It is not possible to do this uh, you know, individually. So there we use a B2B version of the Faraday. Similarly, in a supply chain, there's someone sitting in Tokyo, all right? There's someone sitting in Tokyo who now utilizes a Faraday to procure devices locally. I already know what the issue with the device is. So basically, there's a, also a refurbishment center very lo uh, locally. This is also not, a, not, not something called uh, what you expect to be a refurbishment center in terms of, say, a factory or something. This is a single person sitting over there just with one Faraday, all right? So this person is refurbishing according to my SOP because uh, as and when it comes out of the Faraday, it should state it's 100% uh, accurate as of my standard operating procedure. If it's not, I am not accepting it. So uh, this person is procuring somewhere very locally some, uh, uh, in Tokyo or say in Johannesburg or wheresoever, and the refurbishment is also happening locally. So basically, before the the, the devices uh, is even refurbished, I have already sold it out, right? That's that's the magic of our supply chain and that's how we are scaling with Faraday and that is where our entire patents lies around, right? Uh, and that seemed to be uh, the the, uh, the problem solver for, for this entire industry. So Faraday is now also being used to lobby with the government to import, uh, you know, uh, import refurbished in India. So that's how big the game is. Perfect. Um, there's a question that has come up that you said you that that you started your entrepreneurial journey while you were in the college itself. Right. How did you manage your studies and this? All right. So basically, guys, uh, uh, I, I, uh, one thing, if you uh, if anyone of you wants to, uh, you know, uh, push probably uh, in, uh, within your call uh, within your college days, if you want to push yourself into into a startup, probably do mechanical engineering. All right. You have your physics and math sorted. I don't think you need to study anything. <laughs> but on the other hand, I think uh, see, uh, we all have a lot of time. You know, uh, we enjoy our college life. I did my, I did enjoy my college life a lot. I used to stay in PG, one single room with seven of my roommates. It, it was a great time out there. All right, I'll never forget those days. But I, I think we do have enough time. You know, we we can probably have hundred reasons for our failure. But if we wish, every, everything has a time of its own. Not an issue. The other question that is I'm seeing continuously coming here is, um, what are the obstacles you faced? Did you face any obstacles, by the way? Or it was a cakewalk? And what were uh, the obstacles? How did you overcome them? Sure. See, it's never a cakewalk. Uh, you know, uh, people don't uh, probably bring you in, a, in a, say, uh, in a, over newspapers and over or say over over media, say uh, list you over Forbes 30 and 30 just because you know you probably did something that was a cakewalk. It was never a cakewalk, and entrepreneurship uh, journey will never be a cakewalk, right? And there will be hundreds of hurdles. You know, first and foremost hurdle I think most of the people fall into is what I am the idea I'm thinking about. Does it really have a market? You spend a lot of time probably trying to do a market research, but to be very honest, at that age, you do not have enough experience, you do not have enough exposure to realize if there's really a market or not. You may think, you know, uh, OYO did a great job in India, probably let me create another OYO, but why? What is the pain point you're solving, right? OLA did a great job in India, let me create another OLA. Does it really have a market, right? Uh, so I feel while you're doing something, just go out and do it. You will understand everything over years, it's not possible for you to know, gain enough knowledge, gain enough, uh, say, market research, gain enough, uh, uh, say, uh, enough facts and data around everything. Because something you're trying out there has not been done before. That is why it's a, it's an entrepreneurial journey. It's not a business, right? That's the, that's the major difference. It's something which has not been done before. So if something has not been done before, if you probably try to research about it, there will be hundreds of different, uh, say, say, statements why it cannot be done. But I feel if you if you feel right 
this is a pain point which everyone probably looks forward to and this is something you can solve why not take up uh, take a uh, take a leap right you learn over the years probably the entire idea will change your entire pivoting will change as i said i started in a different uh, thought process altogether today i'm doing almost a different uh, uh, thing altogether right so the this thing does not happen over time it took me years and years and years of efforts to learn what the customer is asking for to run, learn what how the market is evolving to learn the the needs and integrities of the market this happens over time so that's the first hurdle for yourself to overcome the next of course you know creating the product creating probably you know if if you guys are doing something of uh, on the websites probably that that in case if you are if you are trying to do something else so creating the mvp what we call the the minimum viable pr product which you can go out and say uh, say uh, get it in front of the of the customers and so on and so forth investments etc come at a very 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 late stage right those come at probably at a stage where now you have already proven something in the market and it is scaling now you go out there and say you know uh, if i scale by myself it will take me 5 years i want to do this within 2 years could i uh, could i raise some investments from you and and can we scale this together that's when the part of investment comes so that's where the last hurdle you have to face so initially you have to build on your own idea and be okay. flexible about bringing about the changes so you cannot uh, be very uh, rigid about that oh i wanted to do this and i'm going to stay put whether or not it is in in uh, you know need and demand in the market so you have to continuously evolve i think that's, that's exactly yeah. so there is another question uh, forbes 30 under 30 what do you what did you feel being in on the magazine with so many more independent successful people Ah, yeah, it it felt good. All right. Uh, so I think uh, you know uh, the first time I came to know about this pact was when I was nineteen, right? Uh, and ever since I wanted to be on 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 uh, featured over there, right? Uh, and to on, on another fact, so I come from a place called Kolkata, uh, which is East India, right? So there there has been no entrepreneurs ever that featured over for thirty and thirty, uh, you know, from East India ever, not just from Kolkata, but entirely from East India. so it was a great honor for me to uh, you know bring east india on the map of folks started in the 30 and definitely it feels good uh, but as i said right it's uh, once you probably place a dream to yourself and you achieve it now looking forward for the next dream right uh, yes. days are as usual yeah so we would wait for your more achievements to come through and clap for you <laughs> so there's another question that we have seen here is um what idea or ideology makes you walk on this path of hyper exchange how did you get this idea how did i get this idea as as i said right so one of my co-founder is dipanjan uh, dipanjan had well several decades of experience he had built two successful uh, silicon valley startups came back to india joined me in creating this all right so dipanjan says one thing always right uh we all have an intention why we start an uh, startup so basically someone probably had a huge experience in probably a field and starts a startup because they understand the field someone probably starts a startup because they are uh, very neck uh, say they are very interested to you know, someone is very interested in in terms of say music or right? they start a startup in in the in the same field because they have a neck around it and they they love doing it right the panel always says uh, shotonic started a startup not because of any of this reason shotonic started a startup because he wanted to create a unicorn he wanted to <laughs> create a, a billion dollar startup that was the only reason it doesn't matter if it has to be hyper exchange if it has to be something else and somewhere i feel it's true uh, you know uh, the uh, the idea about the startup has evolved over time it has evolved so much and we 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 change our, our pitch deck so many times over over the years sometimes i go back and look and feel you know uh, probably i would not have invested in myself back then right that's 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 how we evolved it's not about did we get an idea we felt you know this is an experiment dollar idea that that is going to happen no we probably thought about something you know said let's let's give a try let's let's uh, put our luck right and over the time we realized the market is evolving and we pivoted accordingly all right so connecting uh, students within colleges to now creating a global brand for refurb it's a it's a completely different monetary change uh, so basically you cannot have a perfect idea it's 
this never a called a perfect idea this is going to work out uh, same for flipkart I'll, i'll give you one example guys uh, those who do not know flipkart and uh, there were a lot of e-commerce that happened and flipkart is not the first e-commerce that happened in india the only reason why flipkart was a successful e-commerce because of three alphabets that is c o d no one in the world ever had a cash on delivery system before flipkart they introduced the cash on delivery system and the rest is history right uh, so did they think about day one i will start a e-commerce with a cash on delivery system and that will change the entire game no right because 80% of india does not hold a card and credit card leave alone right that is where they just one certain morning uh, said you know, let's try it that those are the facts where you pivot where you evolve and 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 probably become what you are today right so the other question is that um, uh, are you planning to expand it the the current company the hyper exchange are you planning to expand it or you are planning to add more companies to your kitty and what is the growth that you see uh, hyper exchange can achieve uh well uh, see uh, today to be very honest yeah early earlier in my days when when hx just started right we raised our first investments and so on and so forth right um i i tried uh, my hand in too many things right i i started investing in startups uh, i started spending uh, a lot of time with 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 other ideas as well and then we realized like uh, that's not not the way forward right you have to be 100% into something so right now my 100% time is into hx right yes of course uh, you know there are there are early entrepreneurs who come down to me for for brainstorming etc i'm happy to you know uh, give my time to them uh, guys you can connect with me over twitter facebook linkedin so ever right I'm happy to connect with you guys as well. But yes, I do not hold any stock in any other company right now because I think that that is where you uh, uh, holding stock in in some other startups. That means where you have to commit a certain time, a uh, certain dedication, etc. Right. Uh, so those things do not work out anymore for me. So it's a uh, first and there will be an exit for me, and then probably I'll look for my next big uh, uh, thing. Right. So, and where do you uh, what what do you fathom the the growth of uh, you know hyper exchange to be like? Uh, definitely, Nasdaq uh, IPO is something uh, every entrepreneur aspires to be. Right, uh, as I al- uh, already said, say uh, seven years back today I'm 26, right? So seven years back when I was 19, I wanted to be on the first 30 or 30 list. So maybe uh, you know five years down the line, I want to be a Nasdaq listed IPO startup. uh every every i think every entrepreneur wants to build something which goes to nasdaq has a has a nasdaq nasdaq listing so yeah. that's where i'm looking forward myself to what age were you when you mm-hmm. you know uh, kind of uh, ventured into uh, you know this entrepreneurial journey first startup was at 19 uh, hx started when i was 21 now i i asked this for a specific reason because again i'm bringing the question there that you know there is no age when you can start your entrepreneurial journey yeah <laughs> so you've heard it from the horse's mouth now <laughs> right all right um there uh, like one question that has has been continuously asked is uh, like did did your entrepreneurial uh, journey help you in getting to stanford or it's the other way around ah uh, i think both are are independent of each other Right. Okay. Both are independent of each other. I think, uh, uh, and no way I see a connection. But definitely, you know, uh, having uh, having a uh, probably you know a great alma mater where you know you are probably uh, have peer like uh, your seniors, super seniors, and probably uh, someone who has passed out from college who done great things. Right. Uh, the the numerous examples from Stanford to so those people who have. went on to become successful entrepreneurs created billions of dollars in value addition in different countries so on and so forth uh, we 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 have a group over there you know that uh, that th- all these people today with their vast uh, amount of experience come down help us uh, with our ideas you know uh, we, i uh, i'm actually in discussion to raise my next round 
So one of my super, super, super senior is is also part of uh, of the investment process. So they are also putting in some uh, money and so on and so forth. So even my US expansions happened because I had my connections over there. So basically, those definitely help you. But I think those are independent. No matter which university or college you are in, I think uh, you, you you should probably be super connected. You know, reach out to everyone, be, be that professors, be that say juniors, seniors, whatsoever. Try to create a try to bring yourself out. All right. I think that's that's really important. Try to bring yourself out. Uh, once you're there, uh, you're networking well, you know, create. You'll, you'll probably find a similar match, similar connect down the line. There's a very, very interesting question that that is important for all of us to know. Is it important to have a degree, college degree? To be an entrepreneur. Uh, I mean, there are plenty of examples we've been reading of uneducated billionaires. So. Got it. I think most of the uh, see most of the uh, while most of the dropouts have uh, have have went on to achieve great great uh, uh, say great great uh, success in their careers. But one thing is important: these these dropouts aren't the regular dropouts from say ABC College. Right? These are from extreme colleges. That really means. Wherever you are with your college degree, it doesn't matter. I said the first thing when we started our discussion is today you can go out there and apply for a job. But if you go out there with probably, say, five years, three years, or whatsoever, uh, KDS trained in entrepreneurial journey and go out there and say, you know, I have done this already, you can be sure I can build your company as well. I may have failed in my journey because there are hundreds of different things that has to fall in place. but with uh, with the structure around where you already have a corporate structure around and it's it's like a automated process today you know today probably the the junior makes the uh, makes the entire presentation and forwards to the senior probably they just do say uh, pfa right please find attached and forwards it out but that's that's the process most people do not even open the emails and read what is there right. that doesn't happen in an entrepreneurial journey today even if there, there is probably a payment to be made we have to make sure because we aren't a big team right we are starting off in, in our early days. We have to make sure each of the pie, we are sure about how it is being utilized, where it is going. If I am forwarding a mail, it is my responsibility, not my junior who has forwarded the mail to me and I'm uh, just forwarding without looking at it. So basically, hard work is important. No matter you are uh, you're probably having a degree, no matter you have years of experience, no matter you have probably studied uh, with lots and lots of degrees. I have seen so many people even failing with with, uh, while they have been set uppers in their school life, right? It happens. So experience is, is, is a different, uh, I would say experience is, is totally different from just uh, just a regular academics. Experience is important. Right. So I'm going to take up a last question now. Sure. Uh, the, if, we are, if we have an idea which is very futuristic. Sure. Uh, and uh, you know it might not be very uh, practical. It doesn't might not sound very practical right now. Should we pursue you know with the thought, or should we give up and wait for the right time for you know people to open up to the idea? I always say this right. A uh, couple of things right. First and foremost thing, we can. Uh, there's so many doubts around right. We can have so many doubts like will will this person accept it? Say for example, if I go into my entrepreneurial career and say spend 20 hours of my life. Right. So on somewhere you would probably find this while you're starting up. You'll spend 20 hours of your life for seven days a week, 52 weeks a year, and seven years of your life. Right. This will probably probably be something that will be very normal for you. It is not something where you know uh, uh, where where I would say uh, is something where you get to see in movies or get to read in books or whatsoever. But this is a true fact, right? Now, are you ready to do something? Give seven years of your life to something which you love? If yes, jump off the cliff, build your airplane before you hit the ground. And remember, persistence is the key. Today, it might be futuristic, but if you're thinking about it, someone else is also thinking about it. The only difference will lie is execution. You might execute the person on execute. That is the only way you will get ahead of the other person. Else we all have ideas. There are hundreds of ideas in all our minds, which we feel is a great idea and can change the world. 
execution is the key explain yeah very very beautifully explained okay i said it was last question but there's another question that is coming okay. up had you anticipated that hyper exchange is going to become this big i, I never anticipated as i always, always said right uh, i never anticipated it it could have not been hyper exchange i would have probably built my next uh, next thing i i thought would be a billion dollar startup right yeah. so basically uh, uh, it was not about a single idea that that made me think you know this is going to be a big big thing honestly even 3 years back i was i was probably feeling there is not enough happening in the market to probably because see uh, if there is a market which does not have any competitors then there is something in the there is some issue in the market probably the market is not big enough or say there is not enough demand or what whatsoever the market is right so we were realizing every of our competitors were small there was not a single global brand we can look up to and say you know uh, uh, to our investors you know even if we do not be successful in becoming an ipo where we take our company public this is the company which is going to acquire us today we have a we have a great example of such, such a thing happening in the market there is a competitor of ours called back market we just raised around uh, 300 plus million dollars and uh, it's it's valued at 3 to uh, 3.2 billion dollars today right it's it's a, it's a seven year old startup two years earlier than us so today our pitches are also such like even if we do not go for probably become so successful become an ipo when this is when say back market is looking at india will probably be acquiring us at a great valuation so right. you, know, you you never know what is going to happen you probably just have to give your best shot out there every day right with this thank you very much for your time it was indeed a pleasure listening to you and uh, we would love to stay connected with you and invite you for more such you know interactions with our students thank you very much thanks anamika thanks forward. bye bye hi again quite a few things connected <laughs> to everything what we were going yeah. through the last couple of hours so, so i think what what you told taught them they were trying to you know figure out if that can actually match uh, the industry right now yes thanks for testing everything so i th think yeah. we got really really good uh, uh, replies from satanic and, and also like the i i noticed a few thing you know change, there are differences between of course the european us uh, perspective that i come from and of course the indian market being different well, to a certain extent, I think the startup culture is pretty similar, but at the same time, some features are different. So it was great that you found also heard from a local person's opinions and details. Certainly, and uh, the good part here is that uh, when it when when your experience it comes from the place of you know. A, application of what you have you know experienced in your life, then it makes a lot of sense. Also, so that you know. Like one of the major, if you heard it, the question that was persistently going in the chat was, we are too young and, you know, at what age can we start? So he was 19 when he started. So if he can do it, so can us. There's another question that was going around, what motivated you? So I have an answer to that question. So generally, nobody inspires us. It's ourselves, our own thing that, you know, that inspires us to do something. That's that's my opinion. I could be totally wrong. I And if I, I'm aspirationally not on the higher side, then whatever, you know, somebody is doing, I might get inspired for a little while and then leave, right? So, you know, uh, most of the time it is us people who, who are motivated, inspired to start do what we are doing and if we do not have that motivation we might look at somebody for a while and then we'll drop it i mean that's that's how i see it yeah and uh yeah i also also 21 when when i started the first attempt so you know you were never too young uh, but of course like if, if you are now let's say 16 17 yeah i mean in uh, by law it might be not possible for you to own a comp or like a, to be a board member of a company currently but you know, at the same time, how many things can you already do in order to progress what you want to do? Like learn from it, have discussions, you know, pitch your ideas, <clears throat> find just build networks, build the capacity that allows you to do what you want to do at the moment you are 
finally allowed to do that because you never know when the time comes when that right person i mean maybe somebody you idolize some some person that is like the some like for me carl so when that uh, person happens to walk past you past you and you have the opportunity to talk to that person okay then you need to be ready <laughs> and uh, you know those <laughs> might happen or it might not it might be the email that i sent but uh, but but really i mean there's so much to, i mean we shouldn't be too focused on you know building the business in terms of you know hiring people getting money you know closing sales it's much more than that it's like the overall sort of story that you start from somewhere you have already started that and now you know it's a step by step progress that to that direction you you want to go so Right. But um, we have covered a lot of stuff today. Tomorrow we are going to hear two more exciting stories. We are talking about how to build pitch, uh, like a pitch, like a sales talk. And then we are pitching on Monday, right? Yes. So with that, we come to the end of today's session. Uh, about your queries, okay, there, there's somebody who mentioned that he tried to some some entrepreneurial stint around at the age of 14. It didn't work out. Uh, trust me, if you tried it once, you will try it again the next time, or maybe the next time after that, you will you will succeed at it. So don't get worried about it right now. You have plenty of time. Continue to think about it, and you know, walk the path. Right? Okay. Now um, the question about attendance certificate. Um, so here, attendance, I'm sharing with you in the chat and also in, in the Telegram group and WhatsApp group that you've received on your email. So those who have joined the Telegram group or the WhatsApp group, um, you will get the same link there also. And uh, you have to answer these questions by 6 o'clock. One. Secondly, the certificate, let the event get over. Please. And the, and the mirror this link. Is the first day, right? Yeah. Please share the mirror link to also to people so they can they can uh, look at that. I I, I yeah. do that. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Right. Right. Thank you very much, Santiri, for taking out time on a weekend. Um, guys, you must know that Santiri has a has a little infant at home who doesn't <laughs> yeah. leave him, and and he's he's locked himself in the room and he's been you know taking a workshop with us. Thank you very much. Apologies You're to welcome. Hugo for that. <laughs> Right. You just woke and, up, so we are going outside. So it's it's okay. Right. <laughs> you know, it was a lot of fun. I hope you guys learned a lot, uh, and uh, and looking forward for tomorrow. Yes, we will do that tomorrow. And um, all the best to all of you. Please make sure that you submit your assignment, preferably by six o'clock. Right. Say hi to your kid, Kashinath says. So hi to Hugo. Yeah, I will. All right. See you right. tomorrow, Thank you, everyone. Thanks. Bye. 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 -bye. Bye.